Hey friends, welcome back to the Deep Dive Podcast. What you're about to hear is a conversation between me and Bobby Siegel. Now, Bobby is a maths teacher here in London, and he rose to fame and became a bit of a national celebrity after appearing on BBC's University Challenge, which is a quite popular quiz show, and he also recently won BBC's Celebrity Mastermind. And since then, he's managed to publish two books, The Life-Changing Magic of Numbers and The Monkman and Siegel Quiz Book. And he's now like one of the go-to guys in the UK, A, for all things maths and numbers related, but more interestingly, I find for listeners of this podcast, his whole spiel is about how we can level up our aspirations and our motivations and how we can kind of get the success that we want in life, kind of regardless of our background and where we've come from, by doing the things that are within our control to kind of level up what we can do in life. And he's really keen on all the growth mindset type stuff. He tries to encourage people that things like being good at maths is not like an intrinsic ability that we either have or don't have. And almost anything is a thing that we can work on if we really want it enough. Anyway, the conversation kind of centers around this whole question of what is the ultimate linchpin for success? However you define success. Is it innate intelligence? Is it privilege? Is it upbringing? Is it what school you went to? Is it what background your parents are from? And to what extent is stuff like willpower and grit and discipline? To what extent is all that kind of stuff involved in this equation for success? So in the conversation, we talk about the idea of privilege and the different types of luck. We talk about the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. And we talk about things like intelligence versus achievement versus self-esteem. I found this conversation really inspiring. Like Bobby is one of those people who's at the same time, like super inspiring, kind of wants to make you motivated to like kind of work harder and achieve your goals. But at the same time, a very down to earth kind of guy who understands his privileges and where he's come from and like really does a good job of keeping his feet on the ground while also being like a celebrity and stuff, you know, stuff that stuff that we all aspire to do. Anyway, I'll stop talking now. I really hope you enjoyed this interview with Bobby Siegel and links to his books will be in the show notes and in the video description. Enjoy. Bobby, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Uh, I'm delighted to be here because I've, I I religiously listen to your podcast. Oh, no way. Yeah, that means a lot. 85% of them. Oh, I, I love them. Awesome. Um, so you're in my head when I'm commuting. Quite literally, you and your guests. <laughs> <laughs> and the guests, of course. Uh, well, thank you very much for being on. We last spoke on a live stream, I think about a year ago, something like that-ish, when I was kind of dabbling with doing the podcast format. Um, for people that might not know who you are, I wonder if you can just give a little quick intro as to how we got here and how you've ended up publishing these three <laughs> three books. Yes. Um, yeah. What's, what's, what's going on with Bobby? Yeah. So my name is uh, Bobby Seagull. So professionally, I'm actually a part-time school math teacher in a secondary school. Although people that follow me on social media might recognize me from the quiz show University Challenge, where I was captain of uh, Emmanuel College Cambridge, where we both studied. Um, and now I'm a TV presenter uh, for road trip shows for the BBC, a quiz show host for Channel 4 uh, and an author. And also work in personal finance, because I used to work before I became an educator. I used to work in banking and chartered accountancy okay. for about seven years. Nice. So what, what was your... What, what was like your background kind of growing up to get you to the point where you ended up a banker and then switched to becoming a teacher and now became this like TV personality mm -hmm. kind of vibe? So maybe we might need to, depends how far we're willing to travel back in time. <laughs> so my parents are from a place called Kerala in Southwest India and they moved to Britain in the late 70s, early 80s and they settled in East London, which is why I'm a West Ham fan. Actually, I haven't got, normally I've got some claret and blue splash. Yeah, because you're big on the whole football thing. I am, but actually yeah. the scarf that I wore here oh, was yeah. claret and blue. So <laughs> yeah, so they settled in East Ham. Right. And in fact, you know, I've born, raised, live in Newham uh, my whole life. Um, so we went to, we grew up in a council estate there. Um, then I went to the local secondary school. I got a Six form scholarship to Eton. Again, that's going from East London uh, Council Estate where you wear Reebok, Adidas, Kappa, and suddenly turning up with that gear to Eton. Like, oh, this is a. Yeah. Again, that was, that, was, that was an incredible experience uh, going from. Yes. I wanted to ask you about that. Like, what was, what was Eton like? And, like, uh, actually, let's rewind about that. How, how, how did you get the scholarship? You must have been very genius. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate the word genius. But we can come to that in a sec later on. Um, actually, so in our school and actually at home, my dad was very keen on us reading. So he'd get us, like, the Beano comic magazine. We'd get some knowledge based magazines. We'd get the Times newspaper. And my school, St. Bonaventure, to be honest, it's a, it was a good secondary school in Newham. Although Newham at the time was a, borough that really struggled in a in a school of like i think there's a 25 secondary schools in the borough yeah. maybe one or two kids in an entire borough would get into oxbridge so clearly the bar the sort of barriers were very uh, very weak at the time um but uh, back then my school used to also get the times newspaper and to be honest i'm a sports fan i should really read the comment section first like, you know the important like, <laughs> business and world politics but i was a uh, head towards the back read the sports read about west ham probably losing back then and then towards the back of the paper 
there was a section that had an ad that said, are oh, you a bright boy? I'm like, oh, me, yeah, I'm a bright boy. Are you from a state school? Yeah, yeah. Would you like a two-year life-changing experience? I'm like, this sounds cool. Apply to Eton College. I'm like, wow, this is cool. So I cut out, back then you had to cut things out. You mm. cut, cut it out, uh, put it in a stamp address envelope, got a prospectus, went for the open day, uh, applied for a scholarship, prepared for it, didn't expect to get it, yeah. and then got the letter, I got a scholarship. And that was, to be honest, it's for... Like, you know, like, you have this like sliding doors moments, mm. you know, not just in my life, but in my family's life. That was probably one of those. And that opened up a whole new... How, how, how much are the fees at Eton normally? So nowadays it's about, it's about 40 grand, I think. A year? 40 grand, yeah. Damn. Okay. It's yeah, quite... because Eton is sort of like elite of the elite, elite. kind of private school. And you got a, a scholarship for it for the final two years? Yes, the sixth form year. So they start, I think, equivalent in the UK, year nine. So kids are 13 to 14, right up to pre, pre-university. Okay. Interesting. And uh, what was that experience like? What was like, yeah, I've, I've, no, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a few friends who like friends of friends who went to Eton, but I have, haven't really asked them like, what was it like? But, I, and, and I guess those are the ones who had gone there from a young age. So mm. to them it's kind of normal, but like for you going from kind of state school in, in East London to uh-huh. Eton, what was, what was that contrast? So again, this, this is almost applying a, a example from after the event, but because Harry Potter wasn't quite big then, but uh-huh. it's almost like living in Hogwarts. Um, you live in a boarding house with 50 other boys. There's a housemaster. Uh, there's a, a dame who's a, sort of the mother of the house. And for me, again, when people think of Eton nowadays, there is a bit of negativity. You know, think of David Cameron, Boris mm. Johnson, and then they sort of tar everyone from Eton with that. But actually, I think most people at Eton uh, have good intentions. Um, and in fact, I think the school makes a big effort to raise and train the young boys to be caring, considerate, think about people around them. Mm. But obviously you get the odd few that <laughs> make us negatives flash. Um, but going there, I went there as a child without any sort of, even though I was someone that was academically well-read and an intellectual, I think perhaps, perhaps I was a bit naive in terms of, I didn't really think about the other connotations. I just went there thinking, wow, it's an incredible chance to go to this place where I get to live mm. um, in this environment where you know, there's football fields, there's swimming pools, there's golf courses. In terms, I never learned to play golf, but I learned to be a good caddy for my friend. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so if you need a caddy, anyone, you know, I've got those skills there. And I think it was just a place where I think there were no limits on capability or your achievement. Because although, again, my secondary school was a very good one in the borough. And I will always, I'm actually, sometimes people, when they've achieved, they'll often go back and say, oh, I, I grew up in a really, you know, in a terrible council state and my secondary school was terrible. No one achieved. Actually, our school, uh, definitely said you can achieve. Mm. But again, but again, in an environment where not many people go into the top universities, um, it can still limit your ambitions. I remember one of my secondary teachers, in fact, I sort of kept in touch with him. Uh, he was telling me, Bobby, the maximum you can get is five A stars in the school. Maybe you can be a dentist, but you know, don't aim more than that. And he was a get too honest. He was a teacher that believed in us in my state school. But when he went to Eton, suddenly they're like, oh, you can run your own business. You can be the prime minister. You can be the best-selling author. Yeah. You can be a famous Hollywood actor there was no limit to the sort of uh, achievement okay. that you could... And does that make a difference to, like, your psychology, I guess? I think it's... I think humans, we can be our own worst enemies. We can set ourselves barriers before society does. Because sometimes people say, oh, it's my friends, it's my family, society. They say I can't achieve X, Y, or Z. But actually, I think we can, be, we can internalize that and say, actually, because of those influences actually i shouldn't aim to go to a good university i shouldn't think about oxbridge i shouldn't aim for a career a conventional career in the city i shouldn't try and become a doctor so i think we internalize almost like the success of people around us yeah and there's like i don't know who's said this concept but i almost think that we average the experiences and motivations of people around us so if Mm -hmm. people that you spend your time with are very negative, very moody, have low self-esteem. We naturally average out, let's say, the five closest people, and we ha- we take on that sort of s- the same traits. We we take on low self-esteem. We take on a low view of ourselves. But if you're around people that think that the sky is the limit, 
actually then, okay, maybe you're not going to end up having, reaching the sky, but you will raise your aspiration. We're going to take a very quick break to introduce our sponsor for this episode, who is Brilliant. I've been using Brilliant for the last few years, and they're a fantastic interactive platform with online courses in maths, science, and computer science. My personal favorites are the computer science courses. I think they're absolutely fantastic. And when I was initially applying to med school, I was actually torn between applying to medicine and applying to computer science. And I ended up going with medicine in the end, which I really don't regret. But there's a big part of me that really wanted to continue learning the stuff around computer science, continuing to understand how coding works. And the courses on Brilliant have given me that foundation in computer science, which I didn't have before. The courses are really fun, engaging, and interactive. And the way they teach you stuff is based on very first principles thinking. Like they'll teach you a concept and then they'll take you through interactive exercises to actually help solidify your understanding of that concept. And it's pretty cool because they're always updating the library with new courses. For example, there's one they've just released called Everyday Maths, which is kind of like a visual exploration of the maths that we use in everyday life. Like for example, fractions and percentages and putting them in a context that makes it very understandable and certainly very different to the kind of boring way that I was taught maths when I was in school. The courses and lessons are particularly good if you have a busy life with lots of stuff going on because they really teach you the stuff in bite-sized chunks. So you can always return to a course at a later date if you don't have time to do it in one sitting. If any of that sounds up your street, then do head over to brilliant.org forward slash deep dive and the first 200 people to hit that link, which is also going to be in the video description and in the show notes, will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. Mm. So uh, yeah, I, I, I fully agree with this. And th there's a lot of stuff that people like Gary Vaynerchuk talk about as well, where, um, you know, one, one thing, one thing I strongly feel is that like, even if, even if you can't change the environment around you or the people around you, you can, for example, change what you watch on YouTube or what podcasts you listen to or what books you read or whatever. And for someone, for example, you know, just to use a very a, a, a trivial example, like for most people, the idea of starting a YouTube channel or going on university challenge mm -hmm. or writing a book, these are pretty weird things to do. But if you're listening to podcasts where, which is interviewing the top 500 people who ever went on university challenge, suddenly it's like, oh, actually, this is, this is fairly doable. If you listen to podcasts where everyone being interviewed is an entrepreneur or a creator, suddenly it kind of expands your box and it kind of makes, oh, actually, that, that thing seems more doable. I remember this happened for me when... There's a guy called Rolf Potts who's got a, a, a podcast where he talks about long-term travel with various people, you know, people who have traveled around the world with just a backpack, people who have traveled around the world with nothing at all, uh, men, women, all walks of life. And in my head, I always thought, oh, travel equals dangerous, equals hard, mm -hmm. equals bad. But just hearing all these interviews made me think, oh, actually, this is, this is quite doable. Uh -huh. um, so I'm, I'm a very strong believer in the idea that like, if you change the, if you change the stuff that you're being fed, like informationally, whether mm -hmm. it's with the people around you or the stuff that you consume, it does have the power to just change the way that you see things. But one thing that I, I really wanted to talk to you about, so your whole, like a big, a big part of your kind of inspirational spiel is kind of this vibe of uh, you can do it too mm. type thing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Molly May recently come under, yeah. came under a lot of criticism for basically saying the same stuff that, hey, if you set your mind to it and you work hard, you can do it too and got a torrent of abuse, um, you know, justified or unjustified from mm. various people saying that, well, you're privileged, you were born lucky, you're white, you went on Love Island, you had all this, mm. these lucky breaks associated with you, you're part of a, this company that exploits people. Like, all of this mm -hmm. other stuff often, I find, gets in the way of the you can do it too mm -hmm. kind of vibes. And I, I don't really know how I feel about this. Like, I, 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 just, I just, yeah, I wanted to discuss that with you. Like, what's your, what's your take on the privilege and stuff yeah. versus the yeah we can all lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps kind of actually vibe. the molly may uh, i remember it trending on twitter i'm trying to learn actually now not to constantly be on social media <laughs> because it is a again we talk about later about like cal newport and deep work and yep. it can be quite distracting to have your socials ticking Indeed. even though you think oh i sometimes think oh it's good i need it for my profession i need it as part of my public brand i need mm -hmm. to be on social but actually you know all the time but my students in school i was uh, we're doing a lesson with my year 11s and one of my students suddenly said, oh, so you heard about Molly May? And I was like, I know what it is. Am I going to get distracted? And I said, well, hold on, towards the last five minutes of the lesson, we'll come back to that. And I did come back. And we had a discussion about Molly May Haig and what she said. And one of my students said, oh, how dare she say that, you know, all of us can achieve all of us the same 24 hours. She doesn't understand our conditions. And I think it's a case of Molly May's message, I think, just got a bit confused. Because her underlying of, like, we all have the same 24 hours, mathematically that's true yeah yeah um and we can all achieve what we want if we put our minds to it i don't disagree with that but i think she just needed to be you need to nuance it by saying there are privileges for example i have a privilege that 
I'm born and raised in the UK. My dad always reminds us. Like he always has these stories where he tells, oh, when I was growing up, we had one TV in the whole village or we had one Cadbury's chocolate bar that we shared for Christmas and we all took a tiny bit. It's almost like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, you know, in the film version where you see them all like grandpa, like they got one chocolate bar. So like my dad, as in fact, I think, Acknowledging privilege is not something that comes instinctively to humans. It comes with people around you help to keep you humble, keep you grounded. Mm. And in our family, our father and mother, dad in particular, he's always, not, not like intentionally, but always told us actually how hard his upbringing was uh, financially, economically, but how he used his mind, his reading to develop himself. So in that sense, it's always like check your privilege, acknowledge, like for example, when I... I, I Totally acknowledge I've had lucky breaks. I've had privileges of being raised in London. Again, I might have grown up in a council estate in East London, but I grew up within earshot of seeing Canary Wharf. Mm -hmm. So having that as an inspiration. So I think it's a combination of, I definitely believe that all of us can achieve a lot more than we're capable of. Um, and <clears throat> the concept of linking that to talent. Um, sometimes people can say, oh, but Bobby, you know, yeah, maybe you had this disadvantage. You grew up in East London, maybe you're family immigrants, but you're, you're clearly really gifted. And of course, there probably are, I do probably possess above average intellect, but it's not that that's helped me succeed. Hmm. What's helped me succeed is effort over a long period of time, coupled with lucky breaks at the right moments. Again, finding the Eton Scholarship. Um, applying for university challenge at that particular moment. So you, absolutely, you have to acknowledge the role that luck can play. Mm. And luck has been important. I think all of us have, again, your YouTube channel. It's incredible what you produce. But you probably had those moments where you had this video that went viral. Like you oh, didn't yeah. expect. <laughs> like, what was the video that for you that like suddenly... Yeah, there was a video about how to study for exams. <laughs> okay, and, and that, was the, that was the one like suddenly things started blowing yeah, up. Yeah, no, but like, I, yeah, so, so many lucky breaks along the way. There was a collab I did with uh, Ibsmo in the early days oh, where his did, channel yeah. was like 20 times bigger than mine. It's like that was... A huge, uh -huh. a huge boost at the start, com combined with this video that went viral. Another video a few months later that went viral for no reason at all. <laughs> um, I'm yeah. There's the, the, there's all this like so many so many lucky breaks that happen along the way. There is that thing of like the uh, quote the the harder you work, the luckier you get. And there is a there is a sense in which yes, there are there are lucky breaks. There was this good blog post I was reading about how there's like different uh, different types of luck. Um, I, I can't, can't, can't remember exactly what it said, but it was like type one luck, you know, is, for example, sheer dumb luck, like the luck of winning the lottery or stumbling across a winning lottery ticket on the floor while you're walking. And like no one can legislate for that kind of luck. But then there's another type of luck, which is the sort of luck that you get when you're, let's say, talking to 20 people a day. If you talk to 20 strangers a day, chances are something interesting will happen to your life. And you might just happen to meet the person that offers you that next job, that offers you that big break, that is in charge of the scholarships at Eton, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you were speaking to 20 people a day where someone else wasn't means that you're far more exposed to that sort of luck. There's another sort of luck that you get by putting yourself out there. The fact that you've written books, the fact that you're on TV, you probably get a bunch of opportunities coming your way. One of those might be really lucky. But if you weren't in that public position, you might mm -hmm. not have gotten, gotten that opportunity. And so I think there's a lot of like, you know, when people, I, 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 I don't know. I think there's a balance between acknowledging when luck played a role, but also that we actually can control luck to an extent and there are things that we can do about it. Yes, I think it's a case of when you talk about the harder I work, the luckier I get. I think there's definitely some truth to that in the sense of if you increase your surface area, almost like, you know, like our, our lungs, the alveoli, if you expand yeah. it all out, it's what, the size of a, a tennis court? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and so the lungs look small, yeah. but again, same with our luck. There's a surface area that we contact and engage with. If we sort of stay very insular, okay, I could sit in a room for three years and come up with the greatest ideas on, on how to improve mindset mm. uh, and then publish the book and then hope, yes, people pick it up. But, or I could write and then constantly blog about it and, and produce YouTube videos mm. and meet people and go to cafes. And each of these experiences and encounters exposes you to other people. And each of those engagements increases the chance of something lucky happening. Again, statistically, as a mathematician, if the chance of an amazing event happening is 1%, let's say, per day, you need more days, more events, more experiences, more people. The, the, the more you increase the number of exposures, the luckier you'll get. So statistically speaking, actually, luck is something that is almost a factor of how much you're willing to put yourself out there. Mm. Yeah, I like that. That's good. So coming back to your 
uh, coming, coming back to you. So Eton scholarship, mm -hmm. two years at Eton, and then you applied to university to study accounting, was it? So maths initially. So actually, this oh, right. is where my story has a lot of interesting sort of detour. So people often look at me now and they'll, they'll imagine a straight line success. Bobby has this perfect trajectory, uh, constantly, you know, exponential growth, Y equals A to the X. Um, so in my gap year, actually, before I went to university, I spent nine months working for KPMG in the city. My dad's actually a chartered accountant. So I was actually back then, I always thought I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll do something at university, but end up working in finance. Mm. So I worked for KPMG for nine months and then did actually a couple of months of youth work in Edinburgh. So if anyone's ever seen the film or heard of the film Train Spotting, mm. I think it's what gave Ewan McGregor his lucky break before he went into things like Star Wars. Um, but Muir House is a very, sort of, it's a very difficult disadvantaged area in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And I spent two months doing youth work there. Um, and actually I started my degree actually initially at Oxford uh, doing maths. And, and people say, but Bobby, you're not a graduate of Oxford. And it's true, I'm not. So I loved Oxford, but I loved it too much. And I think it's a case of Till 18, 19, I'd always worked hard, been very diligent, uh, very focused on my work. And then suddenly, I'm now 19 at university, and all these societies, there's, there's clubs, there's parties, there's the geological society, there's a debating society, there's sports. I think it's a case of, at an early stage of my life at 19, I almost got overexposed too quickly. Mm. Um, and, I, and in the end, I left Oxford and started my second year because I wasn't on track to get a 2-1. And back then, my ambition was I wanted to go into investment banking. And investment banking is quite cruel in terms of if you're not getting a, a very high 2-1 or a first, even if it's from Oxford or Cambridge, you're not going to get into banking. So I, I remember the conversation with my parents at the time. They're like, Bobby, you've worked so hard to get into Oxford and you're going to leave at the start of your second year. Are you mad? And again, a sliding doors moment. I could have gone back to Oxford. I might have ended up getting a 2-1, but I made a decision quite big for like a 19, 20 year old, say, actually, I'm going to leave Oxford because I don't think at this particular moment I'm going to get my 2 1. Mm. And I changed where, and again, I remember literally like the term had already started at different universities. And I was like, where can I go to? And I was looking at Imperial. They're, they're available, but Imperial said it's too late. You've got to come next year. But I was like, no, no, you can't take another gap year. We're going to blame the gap year for you losing focus. Because maths is one of the subjects where when you're young, your mind is at its most fruitful. If you leave, even a year away from mathematics can sort of distract. If you're studying pure maths, which is what I did, and you distract yourself with the real world for a year, when you're looking at things like analysis and maths, and you're looking at really pure, pure maths, you can look and go, why am I doing pure, pure maths? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> I, so at the start of my second year, I made the big decision to leave Oxford right. and go to Royal Holloway and did so maths and economics, so sort of transitioning me further towards a career in the city one day. And so the reason you decided to drop out of Oxford was because you thought you wouldn't get a 2-1? Yeah, I wasn't on track. And with maths, okay, so if I, let's say, did history, yeah. and funnily enough, at Eton, I won the prize for being top of the year in history. Oh. So history is my strong, although maths, <laughs> yeah. I came like top five or six, yeah. maths, or history was my strongest subject. I've always loved the idea of looking at the past. Again, I think I heard V in your podcast talk about, <laughs> you can, you know, history enables us, if you're trying to understand the future, whilst the past, as, as a good financial advisor will say, can't be a predictor of the future, <laughs> yeah. can help you understand the, the reasons, the circumstances mm. behind things. Uh, but being from an Asian family, history was not at the time. My dad, in fact, funny enough, in our family, my elder brother did maths at Cambridge. I did maths and maths and economics. And the next brother did economics at Cambridge. And the youngest one did politics, philosophy and economics at Oxford. So you can see slowly we transitioned from pure maths to almost liberal arts yep. by the end. <laughs> so had I been born younger, one yep. of the younger siblings, my dad would said, yeah, do history, fine. But being the first or second, no, no, maths was a thing, not history. Um, but it was, a, it was almost like a, quite a utilitarian cold decision thinking mm. i don't think at this stage with the with the math degree with the history degree let's say you've not done so well in your first year and you didn't really quite understand 18th century european history second year is going to be about 19th century politics so like actually that's that's that interesting more maths is a very foundational pyramidal subject oh, as a okay. teacher i know that if students don't do well in year seven eight nine gcse they're going to struggle and if they struggle with gcse a levels will be difficult, even if you think I'm going to start really working really hard. And the same with university. If you've not really given it due attention for whatever reason you have, the second year is going to be very challenging. So I thought actually it's maybe better to make the decision. Very difficult one, especially with an Asian family to explain to your, your parents, your uncles, your aunties, Bobby's leaving Oxford. Why? Why? Has he got my mom's convinced I was bullied or, or something happened? Like, no, no, mom, I absolutely loved Oxford. Um, but just it's almost like a an economic decision. Yeah. Because if I wanted to go into banking, if to get an internship, you need to be getting a two one, mm. um, predicted two one. So it was a 
utilitarian decision. I would say. So, so with a family of like ridiculously high achievers, <laughs> do you like? Surely, it's it's very easy to levy the accusation against you with the whole you can do it too. Well, like, well, you're just lucky. You had a high IQ from birth, or or, or things like mm-hmm. that. Like, it, do you get that objection at all, or? A lot. A, yeah. so again, I try to tell people whilst talent, you have to acknowledge the, the, the existence of talent. Mm. Um, other factors play a part. Environment, the sort of the traditional nature versus nurture debate. Yeah. Of course, we are we are we are inherit genes from our parents, and the genes will play a role. But our environment shapes us. Again, our parents, our siblings, our teachers, our friends, your own internal attitude, mm. your mindset. Um, so I think it's a combination of the two. But with me, of course, I do acknowledge, yeah, my, my, if, if all four of us have gone to Oxbridge, some, there must be some sort of genes. But all of us in our family have struggled at various times academically. Yeah. And there are times that we make the decision, actually, I'm going to back away from this subject. Yeah. Because knowing when to give up is a really key part of successful mm. people. Because a part of a, like a, a growth mindset that Carol Dweck, I love Carol Dweck's work, so, uh, a professor at Stanford. She talks about the concept of, you know, we can have a fixed mindset where we limit ourselves or a growth mindset where we think actually um, failure is an opportunity to learn. But combined with that, you need to know when to give up, when to say, actually, this is not for me. In my family, we've always had that nuanced approach where we will work hard. Yeah, we can do it. But there'll be times like actually maybe at this stage, yeah, I can do it. I've gone to Oxford and start my (laughs) second year. Actually, maybe at this stage, maybe I can't do it right now. So I'm going to take a little sidetrack D route. So the the growth mindset versus fixed mindset stuff is interesting because, and I, d- I don't know if this is just a function of the, the, the Kool-Aid that I've been drinking for, for decades or the, the people I hang out with, but I don't know a lot of people that are actually quite like, like fixed mindset-y. Um, but like, do, do you, do you come across that? Like, do you, do you see that in your students that there is this demarcation between people who have a growth mindset and people who have a fixed mindset? And, and like, if so, what does that, what does that look like when, when you, when you're a teacher? Mm-hmm. I think being a maths teacher or math for the for our American international thing is annoying me now. I'm a maths teacher, yeah. but because I I try I'm trying to develop an international audience, yeah. I call myself a math high school teacher. And yeah. I've I've had people in English Twitter like, like Bobby, where's the S gone? It's <laughs> yeah. maths. You're a high school teacher, you're a secondary teacher. Anyway, you're a so, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a math high school teacher. But when I teach my high school <laughs> secondary students, yeah. um, math is one of the subjects where you absolutely dif- see a differential of mindsets. Mm. Because with maths in particular, there are so many students and teachers and parents that will say, ah. Oh, you either can or can't do it, a binary approach. And not, yeah, and in fact, I've got, I've got a little um, object for you. Oh, hello. So <laughs> that, that? Uh, people often, I'll tell you about this in a second. There's actually a, a 3D printed version of my brain. Wait, of your brain? Of my actual brain. It's quite small. Isn't it? I see. Have a look. Have okay. a... May I hold it? Yes, you may. Holding the brain of Bobby Siegel. It, do, it doesn't look very good on YouTube. It sort of, just, it shimmers. On real life, it's more impressive. <laughs> okay. So you have a, a, a 3D model of your brain. I'll explain, I'll explain this in okay. context to, to mindsets. So uh, the BBC has a science documentary called Horizons. And they do lots of things like looking at the benefit of certain types of diet and health and lifestyle. And they did a documentary on intelligence. Oh, uh, and they wanted favorite to, topics. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yeah. They did, and they controversial did, topic. Yeah, very, yeah. very controversial. <laughs> and they did... Uh, IQ tests with lots of people and yeah. try to find out what makes someone intelligent. And as part of it, they wanted a little five minute section where they interviewed someone publicly known for their intelligence and knowledge. Mm. So they're like, mm, who do we know? Oh, Bobby Seagull from University Challenge. And they said, Bobby's the archetypal intelligent person. You know, his, his television shows even call Monkman and Seagull's genius guide. So we're going to, we're going to interview. I, I'm gonna hate, we'll come back to it. I hate the word genius. We'll come back we'll, to that. Yeah. Again, if you're, if you're a listener on a podcast, I'm doing my inverted commas. Yeah. So Bobby Seagull's a inverted commas genius. Um, so we're going to find out, is there something physically different about his brain, about his connections? So I went to Edinburgh University where they scanned my brain, where I've got this wonderful, again, if you're a listener, you're like, what's he got? He's got a 3D printed model of his brain. And they tried to understand, is there something intrinsically different about my brain? And actually what they found was, A, the connections are no better. There was the sparks, as it were, were no quicker than anyone else's. And B, f- physically, is actually a smaller brain than the average person's. So clearly, physically, there's nothing going on there. But it's, again, they said it was, it's a normal, healthy, working brain, nothing exceptional, nothing sort of deficient either. No, so just a very normal, healthy, working brain. And this comes 
to me in terms of when I think of the maths brain. People often say, oh, Mr. Siegel, I have a maths, I have a maths brain. Or more, more importantly, they say, I don't have a maths brain. Maths is not my thing. And I think the way I was trying to dispel this is when we're, when we're born, you know, uh, we're at a hospital. Um, you know, there'll be a nurse coming around with a clipboard and saying, oh, let's check Ali. So Ali's got two legs, two knees, two eyes. Very good, good. But Ali, oh, I don't think Ali has a maths brain. Sorry, sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Abdel. Yeah. He's not going to be a mathematician. He could be, could, be a, could, could be a medic, though. I think, oh, actually, maybe he could be a YouTuber. It doesn't exist yet, but there'll be this thing called YouTube. He could be a YouTuber. We're not born where they set a prescription that say we are able to do maths. We're able to write of course, we've got physical variations. If someone's born where they might be six foot five, yeah, they could be a basketballer. But for things to do with the mind, I think it's very much our experience. Of course, our genes mean that some people, there are some people that inherit minds that give them photographic memories. Mm. But again, but they're very, they're very like, yeah. small minutia. Most people in, this, in the bell curve are in the middle. And I think it's our nurture, our environment that changes us. And with maths in particular, I think it's our experience at a young age. And I, there's a sort of a, a cycle of virtuosity yeah. or, a, or a cycle of negativity. So imagine you're the good student, someone like a Bobby or an Ali at school, mm. where we get given a, a worksheet and times tables when we're five or six, and we get them all right. And the teacher says, Ali, well done. You got them all correct. And Ali's yep. smiling. Yep. And then they talk to your parents, that parents seem to say, oh, Ali's very good at maths. Yeah. And then Ali, for the next test, will work hard because he knows he's, he teacher said he's done well. And the teacher will say the next time, Ali, you've done really well. You've got 100% again. And Ali's very happy and then that cycle continues that Ali now will work harder and then the teacher will praise him more he'll get good reports and then he'll do really well so he'll work hard so there's a cycle of virtuosity yep. whereas imagine someone else on that first test just the night before the test their parents um, they had to take their grandparents to hospital so for that, that week he couldn't study or he or she couldn't study so when they do the test they underperform they get 4 out of 10 in the times table test not because they're intrinsically any different but they had a tough week and the teacher says oh Bobby, you've done really badly today in your test. And what, what happened? And they, they obviously don't want to talk about their family situation. They'll yeah. just say, oh, it doesn't do well. And then the next time they do the test, they, they feel a bit demotivated because the teacher said, you're clearly not very good. And then they actually do underperform. And the teacher's like, oh, what's wrong with you? You couldn't, you couldn't do well in the math test. Then they get three out of 10. Mm. And then now they start developing this mindset where they think they can't do maths. Mm. But actually, the two, the, the brains of Ali and this other person, it's not, nothing really different between them, but one person's had a positive experience, been reinforced by external positive experiences, and the other person's had a negative experience being reinforced by further negative experiences. And then you come back 10 years later, one student is 15, 16, thinking about doing maths and further maths and thinking about the top universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, Harvard, and the other student is thinking about leaving school at 16. But actually these two children, if you scan their brains, they both have, say, you know, the, the student that's thinking about Oxbridge doesn't have a genius brain and neither does the child that's thinking of leaving school. Do they have a deficient brain? Yeah. It's experiences, I genuinely think. Of course, you get the odd genius sure. that, and you get the odd person that, again, for maths, the equivalent is of dyslexia. It's called dyscalculia, where numbers can be challenging. But that's like 2 to 5% of the population. So for the vast majority of us, 95 to 97% of us, we can all do maths. We can all do most things, but we seem to have experiences that seem to limit our thinking. Yeah, yeah. In doing in doing research for my book a few a few weeks weeks ago, I came across this study where um, I think they got a bunch of primary school students, and for some of them, they they told the teachers that oh, this person, should, uh, the, the, we, we flagged this person as having potential, and for some of them, they told the teacher we flagged this person as as, as having like special needs or something like that. Uh, and they just made this up like there was no difference uh, between the students and they looked at how the teacher's attitudes towards those students changed and the ones that were that the teacher had the subconscious bias that oh this is a student to watch they're going to be good this student ended up doing well and feeling much more motivated and enjoying school and the ones where the teacher had been told that oh the student is like maybe struggling a bit ended up doing worse despite there being com completely random selection um yeah i i guess you've, you you've heard a bunch of like like things like that and seen that in your experience as well in fact, there's, I've heard a phrase recently to do with that. It's called the, the bigotry of low expectation. Ooh, what is that? Um, so it's where teachers sometimes, because of a, a student's background, or maybe if their parents have, have been... To, in fact, I taught at a school um, uh, in Cambridge called Chesterton. Hmm. Um, and Chesterton is a great school because there are some children there whose 
uh, parents have won literally like Nobel Prizes because they're professors at the Cambridge University. And then some parents, they're from a local council state, like a gypsy Romani community. And if you're a teacher that comes in thinking, okay, the child whose parent who's like the head of maths at Cambridge, okay, that child's going to do well. So you have this expectation that, ah, if that child's not understanding something, it's fine. They'll get there eventually. Yeah. Because I think because the child has a parent that's a mathematician, they will be fine. And they'll also do well in history and science and mm. geography. And if you have, if you use that sort of mindset of that almost like the bigotry of low expectations you think okay this other child they're from a really difficult family background you know they've got you know maybe one parent household maybe some domestic abuse situations okay so i'm not going to go hard on that student i'm going to let okay they've not done their homework okay i'll i'll, I'll, I'll make an allowances for them okay they already got 30 percent of the test but that's fine i'm not going to push them and that teacher might think, and Chesterton, to be honest, it didn't really happen. Chesterton's actually a brilliant school, so I'm not going to denigrate <laughs> their school. But in schools across the country, there will be teachers that think they're being nice, that think they're actually being supportive by not pushing that student that's from a background where they wouldn't traditionally be expected to exceed, succeed. But actually, by doing that, you are disadvantaging the child. So actually, our expectations can actually influence the way our, our, our students actually achieve. Because if I tell the student whose parents are middle class, oh, you know, you should apply to the top universities, whereas a student that's parents, you know, not, okay, I'm not going to mock builders, but if your, your parents are from a manual building background, you might not expect that child to go to university. If that mindset filters to the way in which you treat the student, of course it's going to change the way that student experiences school. Okay, so you went to Royal Holloway, you did math and economics, and then you ended up working, like, wh what did you do in the world of work? Yeah, that? so so back then, again, the reason behind leaving Oxford was I want, I was adamant I need yeah. to work in the city. You need to become an investment banker. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, or a chartered accountant. Yes. I was like, investment banker first choice, then chartered sure. <laughs> So I got, I got an internship and then a job as a trader at Lehman Brothers. Mm. And back then, so even the Goldman Sachs have been the number one leader. Lehman were the ones that were like, literally like every year they were catching up in every single field, whether it's in the private equity, in their corporate banking, in their equities, fixed income, every single field, FX, they were rising. They were going from 10th to 7th to 6th to 5th to 4th. So they were, and in, in fact, like people have described Lehman Brothers as almost like being at a, at a university, that collegiate atmosphere. Yeah. And 30% of their firm's stock were owned by employees so there was a alignment mm. between staff success and the success of the company yep. so Lehman for me felt the right choice I joined them as a trader initially I worked in uh, fixed income so collateralized debt obligations for a while but that wasn't a great area so when I joined full-time I worked in the equities division again as a trader and I, to be honest at the time I was 23 and I thought I'm set for life. I was generally telling my dad, I got my job. I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30, 40. I'm going to be like a senior managing director. I'm going to be CEO by 45. By 50, I'll retire like with my, not millions. I'm going to say, I was going to say like billions. Mm. Like a billion dollars. That's a, a realistic achievement. Is that realistic? Maybe if you're a banker, you can earn hundreds of millions, mm. including stock options. I was going to say, I'm going to earn lots of money. And to be honest, I don't think there's anything shameful in saying that you want to earn money. Mm. Because now that I've got into a more sort of altruistic sort of career. I got my media career, but I'm a part-time teacher and I was a full-time teacher before. Um, I think there's no shame in saying wanting to make money. And you don't have to even justify yourself. You can come from money and want to have money or you can come from a background like myself where money was very scarce and tight and you think actually then money is a way of lifting myself out of relative poverty. And again, I always say relative because growing up in London, even though I grew up in a council estate, I had a meal a day at least. It was three usually. <laughs> Whereas people in India or Africa, again, I don't want to disparage, but people in in lesser economic circumstances, they can't guarantee where their meal is going to come from. So in that sense, my poverty is, even though in the UK, it's, we're quite low down the spectrum, globally, we're very privileged. So again, mm -hmm. it's acknowledging your privilege of being raised in the council state in the UK. Um, so when I joined banking at Lehman, I thought, yes, I'm set for lots of money. But then about 15 months later, September the 15th, 2008, yeah. happened. If anyone's like a, a economist there, they'll remember that this is when Lehman Brothers collapsed. In fact, the last, in the 2010s, we've had all the austerity. It can be sort of rooted back to, although Lehman wasn't the cause of it, Lehman was the manifestation of it. Uh, Lehman collapsed, led to a sort of global financial crisis. And at the time, I started a little detour. I worked at Nomura as a trader oh, still. Nice, so yeah. I was still a trader for a while, but my dad was like saying, Bobby, you can see that banking is a very risky area. You haven't got a qualification. So mm. most bankers, there's no professional qualification. And my dad says, actually, go and become a chartered accountant like me. Then you can work, you know, you can be a CEO or run a private equity business. And actually, at the time, I went to PwC, 
uh, qualified as a chartered accountant. Actually, part of my job at one stage involved valuing toxic assets of banks because I'd helped worked on them during my time at Lever. <laughs> nice. um, but at the time, my ambition was either become a partner at PwC and become the global partner. Oh, yeah. Whenever I join a field, I never set myself, I'm always ambitious. Even if you never get there, I always say, I want to become the top of that organization. Mm. Um, and if I leave PwC, my ambition is to work in private equity, become like a, a titan of industry or a CEO of a conventional at FTSE 100 business and become the CEO of like a Sainsbury's or a WH Smith, but using my sort of financial acumen. But the sort of, again, there are turning points in your life. So when I qualified at PwC, often people take it as an opportunity to take a sabbatical. Mm. And usually the sort of sexy sabbaticals are where you go to South Africa or New York or Australia. And I was tempted by that, like a three to two month, three to two year, three months to two, no, three months to two year sabbatical uh, there. But I thought, actually, let's do something educational because I've always been drawn towards education so again when I was at Eton I spent every Wednesday volunteering with young people I did in fact even my state school at some board adventures at break times I used to go to um I'd play a bit of football but I used to go to the homework club I used to help other students doing the homework they're the ones that hadn't done their homework mm. and I've always loved the idea of it's weird because helping people there is this sort of um I want to say you've are you being altruistic or I always think by helping people in a weird way, you're being selfish because I feel good about myself. Mm. Of course, to them, it, it comes across the altruism. Uh, Bobby's sitting down, giving me half an hour of his time. And of course, the output is, the outcome is, I'm helping someone achieve when I didn't need to necessarily support them. But actually for myself, I feel good. I feel good about that. So in a weird way, it's almost selfish to want to be altruistic. That's mm. not my view. I feel great about myself. I get dopamines mm. running through my head when I help someone. So I've always had this this urge to support people because mm. I feel good about using my skills and talents to help other people. So at PwC, um, I, um, at the same time, so this is, I'm gonna explain the context of why I worked in education. So I supported also in 2007, I set up a social enterprise called Oxfizz that supports six formers applying to universities. Oh, I've heard of it. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's still going, isn't it? Ooh, or, well, <laughs> it, the, the, so it was running for 14 years. We donated like a million to, yeah. to different charities, but lockdown did for us. Oh, because interesting. We were, yeah. We're not a charity, we're a social enterprise. So we generate income from supporting students that are able to afford paid for six form services. Yeah. So people applying to universities, med school, etc. Mm. But we use the income to support students that aren't able to afford. So social enterprise, so circulating the the profits and income towards. So I never drew a single penny mm. from the organization, even though we donated like a million to different charitable causes and supported thousands and thousands of students. Nice. So I've always had that educational drive. Okay. So at PwC, so it's five years after my social enterprise, um, I took a sabbatical to teach new graduates joining the firm. Mm. And that's like, like people do that because often they think it's giving back to the firm. But I just thought I love teaching. I'd love mm. to spend some time and honestly, like, I love my trading job. I love working in banking. I, I enjoy my corporate work. Yeah. Fact, I often get people saying to me nowadays, Bobby, was the city soulless? I didn't find it. I really yeah. enjoyed the work. Yeah. I love the idea of making money just to show, like, can you beat other people in this game? Can you make more money than the, in the person in the desk next to you, in the, ne in the bank next to you? But when I taught people at PwC, even though these, were, these weren't children, these were mm. 21, 22, 23 year graduates, I loved the teaching more than anything I'd done in my career. And this wasn't like, Often a lot of my projects were like spending a day or a weekend or like a few hours, but this teaching was for weeks. And because of that, I found actually almost like, I know this, these words can be maligned. I almost found like a combination of a bit of my passion, my purpose. Mm. Actually, this is the true Bobby Seagull. I feel like over my life, I developed many skills and talents, but being an educator is where I found I came, came to life. Like I could explain Co tricky concepts in you know discounted cash flow mm. to young people but make it exciting and engaging um and then because of that that sort of transitioned me towards actually i don't think the corporate world is where i'm meant to be i think education so slowly over the next 12 to 18 months i spent more time with my social enterprise in fact i tried running an educational business for a while and then i made the decision actually if i want to become a, a proper educator i need to go back to university train to become a teacher and actually become a full-time state school teacher mm. so it sounds like you kind of realized that that was the thing that you were really passionate about more so than than the trading itself I think it's it's a similar realization to what I had because, 
you know, I've been doing the whole uh, helping people with their maths homework since the age of like 12. Mm -hmm. uh, worked at uh, one of the Kumon study centers Ooh, okay. in, in South End back in the day. Thank uh, you on behalf of the <laughs> students. <out there. laughs> um, and then at university as well, I found that like teaching medicine stuff to people younger than me, which is like really fun. Uh, and I realized after a while that I enjoy teaching medicine more so than I enjoy practicing medicine. And so that also made me think, huh, maybe this teaching thing is the way to go. Um, but it sounds like you had that realization around a similar time and decided, you know what, maybe this is the thing that I'm passionate about. This is where I should like move my trajectory. Yes. And again, it's one of those decisions that at the sort of, if you're an external person looking in, you're thinking Bobby's on, you know, he's on a six figure career, going to earn seven figures at some stage. And you're giving that up to become an educator. And I think this is where privilege comes to play. I had a family that's very supportive I'm coming from, not necessarily because I'm an Indian family, but mm. my parents, because they're Indian. Indian parents are this, and Asian parents, where they, you can always live with them, almost till you're married. Mm. <laughs> so they're like, oh, Bobby, if you want to become a, a teacher, educator, you can stay with us, you can live with us. And obviously they don't expect any rent. Obviously I'd pay for things like shopping and stuff, but they never expect you to pay anything. So I knew that I could take the significant financial hit to go back to university, to become a teacher. Mm. And when I did the training, I found actually this is where because I'd you know, spent time running a social enterprise, I'd worked in the city, um, I'd, again, I'd worked in disadvantaged communities. Actually, being a teacher, kind of almost like utilized most of my skill sets. Again, I loved communicating ideas. And, and being a teacher, there's an element of, again, I've never realized again until the last few years, I love the idea of being a performer. Mm. And being a teacher, you yeah. are an edutainer. Yeah. You're educating, of course, the kids need to learn about Pythagoras theorem, but also you're entertaining them. Again, when you talk about Pythagoras theorem, you can talk about the School of Athens painting where they have, they've got Pythagoras there, but they've also got Raphael, Michelangelo, Donatello. And these are some of the names of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So you can put up, literally, I've had lessons where I put up a picture of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And even though my kids don't know them, they're like, so why have you got a picture of some random green turtles? I'm like, well, these turtles are connected to Pythagoras theorem. And let me explain the steps how, because yeah. these turtles are named after classical um, painters from the Renaissance. And uh, there's a painting called the School of Athens. And in this painting, by Raphael, you can find uh, Pythagoras sitting there in the corner. And Pythagoras is our lesson today. And so I find actually being a teacher, I can almost like be an entertainer, you know, almost like being a, a really bad stand up comedian. <laughs> but, you, you know, they can't leave the class. You know, you're doing, I, I, to be honest, I have dabbled in trying to do comedy, like geeky comedy. Yep. But in comedy, people are not happy. They can walk out or jeer you. My students, they jeer me. They're going on the warning board. Jeer me twice. They're getting a detention. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I found actually being an educator. And again, I, again, I think it's always, I'm always very good at acknowledging things like ego, when you're an educator, when you're standing in front of a class, there is an element of you're the center of attention. Yeah. I like I like the idea of everyone, I've got 30 eyes all waiting. Yeah, enraptured. Enraptured <laughs> about how A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But they're listening yeah. to me on my every word and they, and they, they have to listen. Yeah. They have no alternative. <laughs> but again, fair enough, your ego might be getting a bit scratched mm. and massaged. But at the same time, the output is... I'm doing something that's helping students to learn a mathematical process that can develop their mathematical thinking, that can get them a qualification so they can think about A-levels in university. So it's a case of, it's a win-win for everyone. I feel good about myself, but at the same time, my students are getting a really engaging lesson that makes them think, actually, maths isn't so bad. Yeah. Yeah, this is something I've been thinking. I, 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 I used to think a lot about a few, a few months ago when I, when I had, around the time I had this realization that maybe the thing that I want to do is teaching. I also kind of really vibed with the performer aspect of being a teacher. Um, I feel like I'm an attention seeker at heart and I got into close-up magic and stuff to be a performer. And then this teaching thing is, is basically a performing art. And I always think it's a real shame when teachers view teaching as being an exercise in delivering information rather than an exercise in performance. Um, but part of me was thinking, especially after I read a book, uh, The Elephant in the Brain, which we have like around here somewhere, mm -hmm. around uh, you know the, the selfish motives behind the things that we do. And to what extent me wanting to be a teacher and feeling that as like a calling or a passion is related to my desire for attention or my desire to be seen as an absolute legend by these by these people. Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized that, I mean, every everything we do has some level of status seeking and prestige seeking and signaling uh, some, somewhere in the mix. And it doesn't really matter at the end of the day if my motives are completely pure. I don't think any of us have completely pure motive, motives for anything that we do. And as long as the net effect is that I'm doing stuff that's fun, I'm doing stuff that makes money and doing stuff that helps people, like that trifecta, I think, 
regardless of what the motivations are behind it, that's like a reasonable way to approach life. Yeah, I think so. Like, uh, even when you think about like the the most pure motive in our sort of society is meant to be the mother, selfless mother caring for the child. And they'll do anything. Mm. They'll put their life at risk to make sure their child is fed and, yeah. and looked after. But then if you think about it in a sort of cynical perspective, it could be pre-programmed. The mother might be, again, not she's not thinking this sub, sub, consciously, even subconsciously, but humans have been programmed. We've got to preserve our genes. I've got to make, you know, I've got this offspring now and that's that's my future. That's my me surviving into the future. So I need to do everything I can even at the expense of myself, to help my child survive. So I think, is there such a thing as a pure motive? I mean, so, again, there'll be listeners probably saying, oh, of course there's pure motives. Yeah. But I think there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that even though you may have, like, again, I like being a teacher because I genuinely want to support my students. Mm. But at the same time, I love the idea of performing. I love the idea of students coming up and saying, oh, Mr. Seagull, that was a great lesson. Thank you so much. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging the fact that you gain something from, you know, something, you know, little perk, little ego yeah. massage, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the output is you are helping someone succeed. So I think it's more think about the output rather than the internal justification because your internal motives aren't there for everyone to see. We can't see, unless you're on a podcast and explaining what your motivations <laughs> are. So if you're listening, by the way, my motivations are mostly good. The, yeah, of course, there's some yeah. like self, like I like feeling good, but yeah. a lot of it is I want to support people. But yeah. the reality is it's our output that is can be judged mm. by society and if your output is good helping others then whatever your motive is i don't really mind. yeah so like a consequentialist approach to exactly yeah <laughs> um this is uh touches on something that I, I, I did want to talk to you about so when we were doing um kind of all the all the research um for this for this interview it strongly came like the the vibe that you give across in in media and interviews and you know writing these books and stuff is that you really want to kind of um, so you so, so you're big on the math thing mm. that uh, math is not something that is an innate and you anyone can get better at math if they want to um, and also just the general thing of your in in a way it it almost sounds as if your mission in life is to help people kind of break free, break free of their limitations or or what's that effect. Um, and so kind of two questions. Number one, is that an accurate representation of, of, of your mission? And two, uh, to what extent does that mission suffer from the uh, selfish motives bias as well? <laughs> yeah, it's a good, great question. So yes, I think the mission is showing people that maths is for everyone. And that's, to be honest, the reality is in the media, people are, oh, we've got Bobby, the maths I hate the word celebrity. There's lots of words. I hate the word celebrity. I hate the word genius. Yep. I use them anyway. I don't know why. People say, Bobby, you hate the word, but you keep using it. Stop it, Bobby. <laughs> Internal monologue going on. Yeah, nice. Um, but I'm known as a maths communicator, maths educator. But I try to draw the lessons from maths about mindset to a wider perspective. Again, I'm a UK libraries champion. It's a role I've taken on from Mary Beard, the classicist, and Stephen Fry, the general polymath, because mm. the UK libraries heard about my story. It's in fact, a little side anecdote. When people ask me, oh, Bobby, you're really smart. You're really knowledgeable. You must just like, you must be a genius. And I'll say, actually, I'm not a genius, but my experience have led me to knowing lots of things. And growing up, I was privileged enough that my dad used to take myself and my brothers to East Ham Library every single Saturday afternoon. So my mom would make a really delicious South Indian biryani at lunchtime. We'd eat that, feel full, bellies full. Bellies need to be full before you're there. Of course, yeah. Then he'd, he'd trudge us down. Um, with a shopping trolley ostensibly to do shopping but we'd go to East Ham Library sit there for hours in the library reading all sorts of books on Aztec civilization the engineering marvels of the Victorians and the fiction of uh, Tolkien fantasy fiction and there's actually these Saturday hours Saturday after Saturday that we would spend reading that developed a love for learning and knowledge mm. and had I not had that opportunity had I not had a dad that I was prepared to take us every Saturday. I had not had a library that was within 10 minutes walking distance. These are privileges. I wouldn't have had the upbringing that knowledge became so central. So now when people see me, they're like, Bobby's this curious person that has such a, a breadth of knowledge. Again, I would say breadth, maybe not incredible depth in a few areas, but mostly it's like a breadth, it's sometimes a bit superficial, but that's the nature. You're trying to cover a vast expanse. Um, and because of that, people say, oh, Bobby's got this incredible, you know, he's just got this giftedness. He just learns things. But I just think it's because the more things you know, the easiest to learn new things. And the same thing I'd like to apply to your general approach to mindset. Because with maths, again, I'm going to draw in Angela Duckworth. So mm -hmm. Angela Duckworth, she's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's come up with this concept called grit. 
and her book is called um, Power of Passion and Perseverance. Um, and passion is, you know, oh, I've got this really drive to do one thing and perseverance is where you have got the stickability hmm. and she's got this wonderful formula that i'm going to uh, go through so i'm a math- mathematician so if you're if you're listening in a podcast you've got a pen and pencil write this down if you if, if you're watching you can you know <laughs> look it up so she says that we all have talents and can talents what we're born with through our genes they're the hereditary or uh, hereditary and if you multiply that by effort so you put an effort into something you develop a skill so talent times by effort uh, equals a skill. And then we'll use an example to draw this out in a second. And then you've got your skill. Now you've got a skill. With that skill, we put in effort. So skill times effort, that leads to an achievement. And achievements are what society judges us on. So let me use the example of Emma Raducanu, the it girl. Now she's just Emma. Emma, the, the US Open tennis champion. And when people look at her, they'll say, Emma, the you know 18-year-old, the first, first British person to win a Grand Slam in the female arena for 40 years. And she's the first person to enter uh, the US Open as a, as a wild card and win every, every match without dropping a single set. Mm. That's an incredible achievement. And it can be easy for us to say she's incredibly gifted. It's rare. She's got a rare ability that no, you know, that, that's not seen in a generation. But let's look back. Let's look back at using Angela Duckworth's formula. So the achievement that we see, the tip of the iceberg, is this achievement. An 18-year-old, clearly, clearly incredible, winning the US Open 18. But let's go back. The formula, talent times effort is skill. So she clearly, as a young person, had a talent. She's quite tall. Um, she probably had some good hand-eye coordination, maybe had some speed. So there's a natural talent there, but by itself, it doesn't lead to anything. So... For various reasons, her family decided, let's play some tennis. I think it was her father who's Romanian, so she's Mm. half Romanian, half Chinese. uh, Born in Canada, but raised in South of the River, Bromley. So she's a Bromley girl. I'm East London, so technically she's a rival, but we'll accept South London. Yeah, we'll accept that for now. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So she put effort into playing tennis. And that led to a skill that that now she became a competent young tennis player. So she has this this talent, you know, being able to move around the court, good, reasonable hand-eye coordination, putting in the effort, skill, she's a tennis player. But no one's going to get, okay, in primary school, we get a certificate that says, can play tennis, level one. But that's not, you know, you're not going to brag about those achievements. So now is, she's got the skill that she can play tennis. But that in itself doesn't lead to anything. So with this skill of playing tennis, she put effort over many years of hard work, I'm sure, blood, sweat and tears. And eventually that leads to an achievement that we see, winning the US Open at 18. So again, if you look at the formula, there's talent absolutely... Again, we've got to acknowledge that talent, talent exists. But the thing that's made the difference is the effort. Talent times effort gives us the skill. Then skill times effort is achievement. So actually, it's effort squared. And here, effort is the key. So we can't control our talent. We're all born with a set of talents. Although we'll come back to that. There's some people like Matthew. It depends on your definitions. Matthew's side would dispute that. Say, actually, talent is a different thing. And actually, later, I do want to discuss actually different definitions of talent. But if you just assume it's the innate thing, it's the effort that counts. And of course, if she had a smaller talent, then her, effort, her achievements would be not as great. But I think if we can acknowledge that effort is something that we can put into anything, whether it's maths or learning to dance, learning to sing, learning to develop our YouTube videos, our public speaking, we can all get our achievements are a lot higher than we think we're capable of actually mm. achieving. What do you think of the, the link between achievements and self-esteem i think it's a i think it's one of those things where there's a cycle yeah because is self-esteem innate i don't necessarily think so there's like um was it emmanuel kant has this um tabula rasa we're all born blank slates of course oh. some people i was never going to be at five foot four and a half i'm never gonna not never there was actually but there's a guy called uh i can't think of it bugsy not bugsy malone like short really short five foot two but nba basketballer oh yeah what's not I, steph curry is it Oh, someone. No, re- yeah, oh, there's a really short. So if you're <laughs> yeah. there, tweet tweet back to us. There's a five foot two NBA basketball. So I'm realistically though NBA basketball six foot three, four five. I'm probably not going to be an NBA basketballer. Um, but um, with the the blank slate, it's your experiences, your nurture around you. Mm. So my parents, my father and mother. They would praise us if we did good things. Like we draw a picture. My dad could clearly see that. I, I, I'm, I'm actually my brother. Actually, elder brother Dave is brilliant at art, and both of us used to draw growing up. But our first attempts at drawing yeah. pictures were probably terrible. Mm. But my dad probably didn't say. In fact, I'm sure he didn't say, "Bobby, that's a terrible piece of art. Bin it." Mm. 
then my self-esteem would have been crushed. Mm. He probably would have said, oh, but that's quite good, Bobby. Why don't you try drawing again? Mm. Maybe spend more time on drawing the head of the person. You know, they probably do need two eyes, not one eye. Yeah. But it's, that, it's the way that the conversations that people around you, in fact, like there's a concept of self-confidence. And last year, there's an author called Charles Pepin. So it's quite a new, it's not a new author, mm. uh, born in the mid 70s, but he wrote a book called Self-Confidence. And he said self-confidence is formed by three things. One is, it's the confidence from people are from and in people around you. So let's say your parents, yep. your family, your, your friends, your siblings. Then secondly, it comes from your own confidence in your ability to do the right thing at the right time. Yep. And then thirdly, it comes from a joy in doing the things that you do. So if you look at that, let's say for an example of riding a bicycle for the first time. So firstly, it comes from the confidence in people around you. So when I was ride, learning to ride a bike when I was five or six, my dad would sit behind me, hold the bicycle. I think I'm cycling, but my dad's holding it. And I'd always check behind. All of us had experience. I'm like, oh, dad, are you still there? Actually, I'd call him Papa. So I'm yeah. supporting that. <laughs> Papa, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, Papa's yeah. there. So the, eventually, I'd, I'd have that confidence that Papa would be behind me. And over time, Papa would let go for a couple of seconds at a time. And actually, in, that, in those moments, I'd be developing my own self-esteem. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm learning to ride by myself. But my dad's actually pretty much, he's holding it for most of the time. It's only a couple of seconds he would release me. And then over time, I would get that, what, what the Charles Pepper would say, the, the confidence in my ability to do the right thing. And in this yep. particular example, it's, I would know that as long as I keep pedaling, mm. I'll keep moving. And then over time, so initially the cycling is a bit of a pain because I'm, you know, I'd fall occasionally, cry, tell my dad, I don't want to cycle, I can't do. Cycling's not my thing. Fixed mindset. Imagine someone thinks just because they fall the first time, I wasn't born to be a cycler. You're not born to be cyclers. Mm. But eventually over time, your dad lets go of the cycle. Then you start moving by yourself around the park. Maybe you yeah. fall a few times. Then you start believing in yourself. You've got the self-confidence in yourself to do the right thing, i.e. one foot after the other. And eventually you start loving the cycling. And then eventually you're like bugging your, your dad, say, dad, I'm just going off to the park. And dad's like, stop, stop, don't go by yourself. And so you develop the self-confidence. So there's this, 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 this cycle between achievement, the more you achieve and the more people around you facilitate that. Because obviously the first time I was cycling, hmm. I would have been horrendous. And my dad would have known that. Yep. But he's not going to say, Bobby, you are absolutely horrendous <laughs> at cycling. Just sit at home and do some long division. Yep. You seem to be quite good at long division thing. No, <laughs> but my dad, he fostered that confidence. Yep. And then because of that, I... I had achievements so I could cycle a bit more and then that leads to more self-esteem. So I think there's a virtuous cycle where achievements lead to you having more self-esteem. And that's why sometimes you can see people, especially in the media, in various fields, the top sports people or the top singers, top musicians, yeah. top YouTubers, anyone, they almost forget that they've had to go through that cycle. They can go like, yes, I'm an incredible sports person because I've had this like God-given set of talents and I've worked incredibly hard, but they forget to acknowledge roles of like having the privilege of parents that supported them, a really good training club, luck at the right moments. So then they almost like they forget they've got yep. they're, they're, they're the pinnacle of achievement in their field, but actually it's taken to get that self-esteem has taken iterations of many years, many people around you to get to that process. And so, yeah. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why, like, one of, one of the words that I don't like is success <laughs> or successful or, you know, th th things like that. So you're um, a successful YouTuber. <laughs> immensely Let me now get that adjective. Immensely successful. Immensely. That's the one. Um, like, there was this really good talk that I attended at university where uh, the guy basically said something like, um, everything you have was basically given to you by God, and therefore you have nothing to be arrogant about. And I was like, that's such a nice way of approaching, like, achievement and success and all this, all this kind of stuff. Um, Going back to this, the, this point about self-esteem, uh, to, to, to what extent do you think self-esteem is domain general or is it domain specific? Oh, great question. Domain general versus domain specific. Oh, you also give me flashbacks to maths. Because <laughs> you get maths first year, first year uni domain. Yeah, I think I'm using the word domain in the wrong context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in this context, I think obviously people develop an expertise in a particular field. Mm. And hence the the sort of confidence is specific yeah. to a, a domain. So cool. I am good at maths. So therefore I feel as if you give me most types of math problems, even if I don't get it first time, I would, I feel as if I can back myself because yeah. I have a track record of being competent and confident in that field. But I think then you start stretching that out. So, okay, I can do math. So how about physics then? In physics, when I did physics A level, there were a couple of concepts that were tricky. But eventually, because I knew that I had confidence in, in the specific domain of maths, I thought, okay, the, a domain close to that is physics. And then what happens is 
over time you again with physics then i might then look at chemistry then mm -hmm. chemistry i might look at science then i'm at science i might look at psychology and then slowly over time almost like you're tiptoeing your self confidence you tiptoe from a lily pad mm -hmm. of maths to the lily pad of of um, almost like a, you know the gecko lizard that skates on water yeah. so you're skating on the self confidence of maths and that's your home pad home base that's the strongest one but eventually you can skip onto other bits so i think over time self confidence in a specific domain can lead to self confidence in more fields so that's why sometimes you find that people that are polymathic so a polymath is someone actually the technical definition is someone that has expertise in two or more unrelated fields and to be honest i personally think no one in the modern modern world is a true polymath because da vinci was a polymath you know he was someone that was at the forefront of art at the forefront of understanding human biology at the forefront of understanding um technologies in his development of like the helicopter or sketches for them or tanks but to be at the forefront of any field you've got to devote years and years of effort back in the 1600s no disrespect to da vinci but technology wasn't that advanced yeah. <laughs> art wasn't as advanced etc so it's easy to become a world leader whereas nowadays there's seven eight billion people we've been you know we've had 2000 years since ad of development it's going to be hard it's going to be it's almost impossible to become the best in one field let alone two fields so a true polymaths don't really exist but when people say polymathy all they mean is general real high confidence in a field and that mm. there are many people i would consider you like a polymath you're someone that's had a medical oh, training <laughs> and now you're obviously a, a world class youtuber so you you got polymath and again myself i'm someone that's very confident in maths but i can you know apply that in my media field so polymathy so in that sense i think people can apply a domain specific confidence and use that as a springboard as a lily pad to jump onto developing general self confidence mm. interesting Yeah, I like that model. That's nice. It's like I think when I started my first business that was successful, it was a sufficiently different domain from the other things I'd done, like medicine and school and stuff, that all of a sudden it kind of sprouted this sort of new new like lily pad almost. And like yeah, when I was younger as well, it was like maths was my thing, but then because maths was my thing, science by definition became my thing and then you like know, the next stuff. You know, I'm going to say yeah. that Ali Abdul maths was his thing. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> his first love, your true love, yeah. <laughs> the true love exactly. <laughs> um and then in secondary school there was like I ICT which was again somewhat related to maths, but starting a business was sufficiently outside outside the scope of that. Um doing the close-up magic stuff again outside the scope, but doing the teaching stuff kind of related to public speaking and I like this sort of what I'm imagining in my head is that the as these little like lily pads sprout you end up actually covering a bunch of you know things like dancing right now is way outside that experience because I haven't had much experience in getting really good at like a physical thing that requires physical coordination beyond racket sports um being able to cook is something that I have low confidence in because it, 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 it hasn't yet overlapped with any of the stuff mm. but I think the more of the stuff you do the more you have a general sense of if i set my mind to this thing i can probably figure it out uh and th this is what like i think this is just a useful attitude to have in general that i found in this uh, again if i think if i think back to my youtuber academy people uh generally it tends to be the older ones that have got have uh, adopted this mindset of you can't teach an old dog new tricks mm. where i've never had formal training in editing therefore i can't do video editing it's like well you know The, the internet <laughs> like yeah, it's short it's not that hard to learn video editing come on or oh i've never had formal experience in public speaking therefore it will be hard for me to learn it's like i mean it's 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 a skill like anything else and i think there i w i wonder if there is a general uh, a general trait of uh ability to learn stuff which i don't think is innate but it's certainly something that we believe in ourselves through repeated instances of trying something new being able to learn it which is why i think actually when you're younger or actually at any age optimizing for just trying out lots of new things and getting good at a bunch of different things and becoming like a a generalist almost in 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 multiple things does lead to this trait of every everything is figureoutable i can figure it out if i put my mind to it um which then theoretically gives you mo many more opportunities in life because i remember one of the stories you told when we when we chatted first was you were invited on this pod, on this uh, television interview you had no idea what they were going to ask you you'd never done it before mm. but you were like screw it why not yeah. i'll figure it out live sure tv and on bbc yeah and that's like so scary for normal people but i think because i suspect because you had all these like examples of success with the supportive environment mm. you got this general trait of i'm sure i can wing it <laughs> um and that ability to wing it gives you a lot of opportunities to say yes to stuff yeah and i think actually related to that 
um, I'm going to bring up the word imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah. Because I think there's so many people, even like even in my family, all high achievers, myself. Sometimes we think, I'm like, do I really belong here? Like sometimes when I'm, te- when I'm teaching in front of a class, why are these children listening to me? Or my or my brothers bring an exhibition. Why are people coming to watch, see my art? Um, or my youngest brother's trying to become a barrister. Like, what, what is the judge really going to listen to him? Yeah. Or when I'm on television, are people really going to watch my program? Sometimes I feel like an imposter, and all of us have had moments. And I think when you realize that everyone's actually just winging it, sort of. There is no textbook or model template on how you should follow life. Every single life is every single life is unique, but everyone sort of. What you've done, again, if you make a mistake, if you're feeling bad about your first ever TV interview, writing a book, your first ever YouTube channel, I guarantee you there's been tens, scores, thousands, millions of people that have been through the same process and, and people have succeeded. So what you're feeling of inadequacy is not unique. Mm. And I think you have to, I've heard lots of people say this, you've got to learn to feel comfortable about being uncomfortable. Mm. And I've learned to do that. There are so many times in my life where I've felt uncomfortable. Even this morning, I was thinking, oh, Ali Abdel's interview, you know, it's amazing because it's a great platform. Lots of people listen to it. But I just remind myself, Bobby, you do this all the time. Just, mm. yeah, I feel a bit uncomfortable. But actually, I'm just comfortable with the pro. My family are like, Bobby, how do you just go and do these? Like yesterday, I got invited to a TV interview, um, literally the night before, talking about maths, research from Cambridge about should maths be taught as a playful activity compared to direct instruction and to be honest i don't know a great deal about that field but i just only said yeah i'll do the interview and i did the interview and it went really well my family like, Bobby, how do you do that and to be honest i do feel uncomfortable but i've learned to accept that feeling so it doesn't cripple or damage my ability to perform because it's almost like if you're like a, a, a like a basketball like in fact michael jordan i love michael jordan so in fact one of my my second <laughs> show second and tell, prop. Yeah. I, I, I was going to bring the the 23 Oh, not the 23 Scotty Pippen, I think. The, the Michael Jordan shirt, but I thought this was easier to hold. Yep. My family got this for me. So during lockdown one, I think we mentioned this in our, in our YouTube chat, I watched The Last Dance. Mm. So lockdown one was a bit intense for everyone. And The Last Dance is a Netflix documentary charting the rise of the Chicago Bulls basketball team. And to be honest, I never really followed basketball. I mean, I was obviously aware of Michael Jordan. But watching this documentary, you come to hear of the incredible success and achievements of this basketballer and he's achieved the three-peat, three-peat twice won the 91 to 93 NBA championship uh, and won it again from 96 to 98 and that's not been done since he's won every single NBA final he's been in it's an incredible achievement um, and of course he has the privilege of being a six foot five person uh, getting scholarships um, having the self-belief but even with him when he first started out, he came as this incredible college junior from University of North Carolina and said, and he won the Rookie of the Year. But for a few years, they didn't win an NBA championship. So everyone was saying, what's happening to Michael Jordan? Why is he not winning? And then he had Phil Jackson, who joined as the coach of the Chicago Bulls. And what Phil Jackson bought was an additional facet. He had the sort of philosophical mindset. He, he appreciated Native American philosophy, Zen Buddhism. And if I don't talk about this one principle there, that probably helped Michael Jordan to realize his potential. So Zen Buddhism, there are lots of aspects to it, but the one that Phil Jackson focused on in particular was being able to be in the moment. Mm. Because Michael Jordan, before Phil Jackson, I think, will acknowledge that there are many times that his teammates would mess up or he would mess up. And then during the game, he'd be a bit frustrated thinking about, oh God, I can't believe I missed that three-pointer. And then he'd start thinking about the next game. Oh, the next game's against um, another big rival, the New York Knicks, and we can't afford to make that same sort of mistake. So he forgets that actually, the, the, if you deal with the present, then the past will get taken care of and the future is just a collection of lots of moments in the present. So he adopted this Zen Buddhist mentality where you deal with things in the moment and you let the future take care of itself. And in the same sort of mentality, I try and deal with my life like that. Of course, I had lots of, and again, I'm sure someone in your podcast mentioned this, the, our worries, our anxieties are often about things in the future mm. that many of them don't even manifest to be true. But as humans, we worry about those things. But if you deal with, obviously, you still need a strategy. Mm. You still need your goals, your objectives, your odyssey, as it were. It's good to have it there. But if you deal with the current moment, being quite zen 
and deal with as long as I deal with this interview now, this question here. So I'm okay. Even now, I'm thinking about this evening. I've got to write a blog piece. I've got to mm -hmm. pitch my F next Financial Times article. I've got these other worries in my head. I've got to plan for lessons for next week. Okay, they're they're worries in my head, but actually, they all get dealt with. A Zen Buddhist approach is like Michael Jordan did, is just think about this interview. In fact, not even think about the interview, just think about this particular question. If I deal with this question well, then the other questions would flow. Yep. And I think with my TV interviews, my media work, I always think of that. Just deal with the moment now. Nice. With, again, at the back of your mind, you definitely got the longer term picture there, but deal with the moment now and the future will take care of itself. Oh, I love that. That's great. Um, w w one thing I wanted to come back to, you. so uh, we've talked a lot about um, the privilege of a supportive upbringing as being like a thing, and how if you're that kid that gets told they're good at maths, then that turns into a virtuous cycle. If you're that kid that has a bad day because something happened and suddenly you're tarred with the brush of being told you're bad at maths and then that affects your own internal, etc. Uh, 15 years later, you've got this 21 year old who, you know, where one is in this kind of virtuous cycle position of having their strengths uh, celebrated. And the other one is in this position of like, mm, you know, and, and you can maybe kind of trace that back to early days upbringing. Uh, for those 21 year old or 15 year old or 65 year old, like whatever, who is l listening or watching to this now, who can't do anything about their past. Do you have any tips that help us? Like, w what if we were that guy that didn't get told they were good at maths? Mm -hmm. what, or, what do we do about it? Yeah, so a, a couple of things on that. Firstly, what I'd say is, is that we can always change our story. Mm. Because the past has been written and that's done. That is history or her story. Uh, if we're going to make it, yeah, <laughs> it's her story and his story. Yep. But the future is unwritten and we can still write that. Of, of course, your hand may be more worn. It may feel a bit, you know, your fingernails may be clipped and your pen may not be as, as good as someone else's, but you still have the opportunity to write your future story. And again, one thing that we, we again, in, the tw in 2021, or have this privilege of, we live in an era of technology privilege. Mm. 20, 30, five, 10 years ago, they didn't have this opportunity to go on YouTube, look up tutorials on how to learn, how to do calculus, or how to edit a video. People 10 years ago, they didn't have the opportunity. If your teacher in 2000 or 2010 wasn't great at math, mm. at teaching you, you were stuck with that. You could not do anything. Whereas now, go into Khan Academy, go into Skillshare, go into anything. I think you mentioned Skillshare so many times, it's now in my head. Sponsoring this episode. Yeah, yeah I know. I think, who knows. <laughs> um, but you have the opportunity, you have that technology privilege. So you can use the internet podcasts to inspire you. Again, listen to people that are successful, the best in, in their field, the best mathematicians, the best YouTubers, the best entrepreneurs. And you can use that as, okay, maybe your upbringing didn't put you in close proximity or contact or service area with those people that would have inspired you. But now with technology, you can be just a couple of steps away from an Ali Abdal. You can, you can interact with him, listen to him, learn and be inspired. So I think one is you have the opportunity to learn from people in a way which we've never had because of technology. But secondly, I think it's also maybe growing up, you didn't have people praising you and saying you're good. So your self-esteem isn't great. But I'm going to draw upon a concept from Matthew Syed. So, you know, we talked about talent. Mm. Is it innate? Is it not? And again, I think the reality is the answer is a bit grey. Of course, there's a con there's a, a nurture element, but you can absolutely oh, nature element, but you can absolutely nurture your talent because what Matthew Syed says is that there's a myth of talent because when we see the greatest people in every field, YouTube, in sports, in music, in maths, in politics, we all think these are talented people mm. that were destined to reach the top. And of course, there is the element of survivorship bias. If you reach the top, then you tell your story. As a, there, are a lot, there are hundreds of people out there. And I, I could be an example of a, someone that tried YouTube for a while, yeah. didn't quite work out, and I decided to reinvest my efforts elsewhere. Although I am going to be trying TikTok very soon. Oh, because, hello. Yeah, because I realize my young students, they're very much... Yeah, they're on TikTok. They're so, not on YouTube, so really. I, so I'm now... Let's see if cut, we'll come back in six months, but yeah. TikTok is something I'm trying to get into. <laughs> Solid. We'll see if it happens. But Matthew Syed said, talent is something that can be developed. And the way it can be developed, okay, so he says this example of thousands of hours, so that's, it doesn't have to be thousands, but thousands of hours of purposeful practice hmm. can lead to you developing your talent. Okay, thousands of hours can be extreme, but again, hundreds, tens of hours. Hmm. So if there's a field, let's say you want to improve in your tennis, or your singing, or hmm. your baking, or your dancing, or your YouTube editing, 
if you put in hours of purposeful practice, it can't just be make the same video again and again and again and you're not learning from your mistakes and people tell you, oh God, you, need, you're, you should subtitle it, you should speak slower. And you don't, you're like, no, 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 no. You don't take on that advice. You're yeah. not going to get better. So purposeful means you take on guidance from people. You take on feedback. You ask people for support. You critically self-evaluate. You're not embarrassed at looking at yourself and going, oh God, you're cringing at your first attempts at making a, yeah. a YouTube video. It's got to be purposeful because if you're just doing meaningless practice and some of my students, sometimes they're like, they'll ask me this question, sir, what should I revise for my exams? Uh, and often, I honestly, a lot of my students will do the things that they're good at. Ooh, Again, yeah. And like they do this and I, to be honest, the first couple of things, fine. Just to get your self-confidence. But you need to do things at the frontiers of your of your between your knowledge and lack of knowledge mm. the final frontier that 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 area there it's almost like was it the zone of proximal development yeah <laughs> yeah where if you just constantly do things that you're very comfortable at yep fine you'll stay there you'll have a nice happy comfortable life and there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that if you want to feel comfortable that, that's a nice lovely feeling mm. but if you want to stretch and develop yourself if you go for something that's truly unattainable imagine the first time i'm playing tennis I go and play Emma Raducanu. Yep. Like, okay, to get a single point, tennis is not my feet. Not a good idea. But go to your local club. So you go to the zone of proximal development where you are in this zone where you're not in your comfort area, but mm. you're not like ridiculously outstretched. But you're definitely feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Learning to feel comfortable with being uncomfortable. Have, has your dating experience been sort of shaped by the fact that you are a celebrity? Okay, so the the worst ones are the ones where it comes up very quickly. So on Hinge, to be honest, I I also acknowledge the privilege of, because I've got a television personality, it enables me to, I hate this phrase, but punch above my weight. I can yeah, date, I can date people that perhaps if I was just a class, if I was, I guess what, I want to say, I'll never say just a class teacher. Yeah. If I was a, cl a class teacher yeah. who didn't have a public profile, they probably wouldn't be interested in the first instance. Whereas sure. if they got to meet me, but they just wouldn't, look at me Actually, uh, yeah. whereas with my tv personality profile i get to date people that perhaps wouldn't initially yeah the swiping they wouldn't have given you the time of day initially wouldn't. but yeah. you know <laughs> so it enables me to you know rather than being in the featherweight division i can yeah. be like, in the welterweight <laughs> sure. you know, you're, not, you're not gonna jump from featherweight to super heavyweight but you can jump a couple of divisions yeah. i think in dating your career and your work can help you jump a couple of divisions. yeah naturally it's like um there's a there's lots of data from these dating apps that show that um you know, bachelor's degree versus master's degree on your dating profile increases your success rate by 25% or something like that. Uh, so is, is, is your profile picture the university challenge one? <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, ooh, it's, 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 so let me have a look. So it's changed. It's weird. I've gone through phases where yeah. I, I become a bit self-conscious. I've had some bad dates. So I take off all the public stuff. Oh, a lot of times I put the public stuff back up. Like I've got one there before it says, so, so I've done stuff on the maths of dating. I've done talks. I did a talk with the new scientist. Yeah. In fact, at some stage, I want to write a book on, when I get married, yeah. how I use maths to find Mrs. Seagull. Oh, yes. One, that would be good. Yeah. And one, in fact, one person though I've dated, I'll, I'll call her Cypriot now, even though she was Greek. Yeah. She told me, she's very smart, but she said, if you, if you ever publish a book, you must not mention me in your book. So I won't. I'll just change her profession. Of course. She yeah, won't be a change, dentist. Change You'll become a doctor. Yeah, absolutely. She won't be Greek. She'll be Cypriot. <laughs> <and I'll just laughs> and no one's going to watch this uh, <laughs> figure out. Yeah, yeah. 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 You're going to have to change that as well. I'm going to have to change that. But uh, the, 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 the main picture was uh, on the BBC, I was there saying, I was on BBC World News, how this, how a mathematician using maths to find love. So I put that as my, nice. and I got a lot of attention. People were like, oh, tell yeah. me, what are you, what is your formula? So I actually got a lot of attention, but then people are this, I found some people just intrigued about the TV background. Mm. But then sometimes I put the university challenge picture because if some people, what the hell is that? They're not my kind of person. Yeah, your kind of person will understand, be like, whoa, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. But then there are other, but then even with those people, you've got to sort of be careful because some yeah. people, they then are attracted to Bobby the, the personality rather than Bobby the... Okay, but that's, surely, surely that's the first, at, at first glance. Because like, realistically, we're all attracted to certain things about yeah. people at first glance. It doesn't even need to be stated. And that, that's <laughs> and why so, I found Ali, yeah. the best dates have been blind dates. And I yeah. always, had, in fact, lockdown has been really tough for me because I've gone on dates with people on Hinge. And to be honest, I go on lots of dates. I, to be honest, it's I got to the point where, you know, you've got a dating threshold yeah i passed my threshold i've like i've done enough now i'm actually okay. ready to <laughs> you're past your 37 I'm ready, I'm, <laughs> yeah. uh, well i'm ready to meet someone settle down okay. the next person that's reasonably 
good. Yeah. I'm all like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, yeah, they're gonna get the jump ring. on that. They're gonna get the ring. Uh, metaphorically. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe physically too. <laughs> um, but uh, I found the best dates are when I go to friends' parties and I ask people if you know someone that you think might be interested in, in yeah. a geek like me. Uh, there's a song, isn't it like Freak Like Me uh, by 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 Atomic Kitten? Yeah, we freak did a, like, yeah, something like, like that. Me. Yeah. Like <laughs> but Geek Like Me is my yeah. version. Oh, nice. Geek Like Me, Math Like Me. <laughs> I, th- I, I vaguely remember the song. Um, have, you, have you thought about, oh, there was this um, article that went viral a couple of days ago. Uh, this guy who put up a billboard saying like... The Asian guy. A- Asian guy, yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you thought of, like, given that you have a public profile... Have you thought about doing something like, a, I don't know, just uh, p- p- putting a call out for applicants, as it were? Although, funnily enough, I do sometimes use my Twitter and Instagram. Mm. Sort of like partly self-pity, partly actually will request. I'll say, Friday night, I'll describe genuinely, most, like every once in every couple of months on a Friday, I'll say, this is my sad Friday night routine, yep. reading The Economist, listening to any questions, putting some jazz on. Yeah. What do other singletons do? And it's sort of like, partially do, I do, I'm interested in what people are doing. Yeah. But also I get a couple of DMs and from people saying, ah, oh, shall we go for, you know, I've got a friend. Yeah. Um, so I do, but I don't think I'd be shameless enough. Again, my, my threshold of... Mm. My, threshold of cringe. Is yeah. not at the level where I would put an ad saying, I'd love, although, funny enough, I remember at some stage I had a chat with BBC about maths pro, a program on using maths to, to create like a, a dating algorithm, dating Ooh, agency. Nice. And then the subject would be me. So it'd be yeah. partly comedy, partly maths, yeah. partly commentary on how online dating is. So to be honest, at some stage, if I'm still single, yeah. I, will, I do want to create a television program that looks at the dating world yeah. and how things have changed, evolved, maybe using me as a test sample. Um, again, yeah, I'm, because like the numbers and the data behind that is just so interesting. Um, that it would be... It would be, it'll, it'll be really cool to make a program out of that. And I think, again, yeah. this is what I, again, is almost like switching back to maths. Yeah. Maths, when, to most people, they're not really going to get excited by, by about prime numbers or geometries of different shapes or platonic solids. But if we engage them on things they are interested, yeah. football, the Premier League stats, yeah. wage transfers, the economies of that, or Bake Off mm. and looking at the ingredients, the recipes, ratios, or talking about the dating market, the, you know, the odds of meeting the right person, when you, or YouTube. And again, my students are talking about like the, how much you might earn if you have a million subs, two million subs, 10 million subs. When you engage people on things that, are their home territory, their zone of proximal development, yeah. <laughs> and then find the maths and stats and numbers and that, then you can win them over. So I always believe with maths, in an ideal world, I'd like to be in my ivory tower and tell people, come everyone, let's talk about the Riemann hypothesis and finding the distribution and prime numbers. There's genuine amazing beauty in that. But I'll draw some people, they'll, they'll come to my BBC program, yeah. my but YouTube For the most part, no one can. No, no. <laughs> yeah. But if I jump down into the reality dance show, yep. and I, there's, in fact, there's one scene where we do a bungee jump. Yep. And obviously, I've never done a bungee jump. My partner's never done a bungee jump. But I talk about, she's panicking, and I say, don't worry, all it is is we're converting kinetic energy uh, into uh, uh, potential energy and it's being dissipated through mm. oscillations to zero. So our mass times gravity times height mm. gives us our overall energy. But don't worry, my mass is smaller than yours. So we're gonna, and, and, and again, yeah. it's a funny way of, it, the people watching that, they're watching because it's comedy, so, yeah. you know, it's a bit of a laugh, but also they're, they're being re-engaged with a bit of maths and science. Mm. So I think it's like, I could have just been in my tower and says, who wants to learn about potential energy and kinetic energy being dissipated through oscillations? I get some people say, cool. But most people are like, nah, that's not my thing. Yeah. It's not my shtick. But if I do it like in a funny thing with a bungee jump on a, on, a, on, a, on a dance reality show, people be like, Bobby seems a bit crazy, a bit cool. Let's go and learn about his science. So I think finding out their grounds, where they're comfortable, their zone of prox- I can't say proximal development. So I say proximal, like approximate. So their zone of proximal development yep. and engaging them there. Nice. And dating, in fact, that, in fact, that's my excuse to my mum about being single. Yep. As soon as I'm not single, I can't use date. I can't talk about my my failure in dating and one over e and the different ways of like dating. How you know this? You know, you can actually model um, p- how people argue in a relationship using the same modeling for a nuclear arms race. Oh, interesting. Yeah, the same sort of iterative yeah. process. So there's so many fascinating. That sounds like things. a series. Yeah, yeah, like literally a series because one person 
argues, the next person argues yeah. even more. And the same model yeah. literally can be applied to a nuclear arms race. Nice. Um, that can be an next book, the, ma the, the Maths Behind Love. That's gen I think it's, <laughs> I do want to write that, but I want to write it with the, the view of how I found Mr. Yeah. Seagull because I wanted to have a positive ending. Sure. And then, it, yeah, the ending will say, yeah, I, I want it to not just be like, I'm a bitter old man yeah. because I failed. <laughs> yeah. Maths failed me. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be bitter about it. Actually, no, I am being a little bit bitter. I am now like, you know, like on Facebook and Instagram, you see all your, all your friends with like enjoying the weekends. Yeah. Do you want to like, I'm, we talk about, you know, the book, what is it? The, the Art of Being Lonely? What's it called? How to Not Die Alone. Yeah, because I'll be honest, <laughs> generally i've always been i've always found silver linings i'm always a, i find the positivity mm. of course i feel sadness but i don't let it pro i think things like depression happen when you when you the sadness you make it part of your being and you're like i am a sad person therefore i feel obviously there's chemical imbalance and stuff mm. of course things like that but for no, for most people for sadness you don't i don't allow the sadness like for me the, the sadness in my life is i'm signal yeah. single but i make humor out of it by saying oh i can use it to engage people about maths yeah. it's a funny little liner even today so you find humor in it um but i think for me in my in my life for my my life that's really exciting and fun and and i you know and my my threshold of um i keep forgetting it the threshold of cringe cringe is growing <laughs> yeah. which i'm really happy i'm really i want i want the threshold to grow massively and become yeah. enormous i hope it's not correlated to ego though <laughs> oh is it correlated to ego i know i i think it's inversely correlated with ego i think threshold i think the more the lower our cringe threshold the more so the more fragile after. the ego is yes yes because if you're afraid of how you come across that's like a, an ego fragility type yeah, thing because i'm not if you don't care how you come across it's like whatever that's a good point yeah so i think so i think you're good, you're good. yes i'm good yeah, yeah <laughs> thank you i give you comfortable i'm feeling comfortable at being uncomfortable about the lack of being in a relationship nice i like that yeah that's good um, one thing I was going to ask you, uh, just pure, out of pure curiosity, so you've now published these two books, well, hardback, paperback, yeah, yeah. Monkman and Siegel quiz book, Life Changing Magic of Numbers. You're this big like celebrity guy. You've got all these appearances and shows and stuff. What are, and, 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 and feel free to be as coy about this as you like, but like, what are the economics of being a public intellectual like you? <laughs> so what I would say is, firstly, if I was not on television, I never would have been a published author. Yep. in terms of practicality and in terms of interest. Mm. So before I, okay, so when I went on university challenge, I harbored no ambitions of ever doing media sure. work. I thought, so I was acting head of a maths department. I was ambitious, I changed careers. So again, I was thinking within five years, I want to be a head teacher. Yep. I was again, anything I've gone into, I've always gone in with drive and ambition. I've never yep. joined a profession or a field thinking, oh, let's just be content at being content. I want to like, <laughs> being content is good. On Friday, 10 o'clock by yourself, but you, I, I, the drive. You've got the drive. I've, I've got the drive, yeah. Um, but I never thought I want to be a writer for the Financial Times. I want to write my own books. I want to have my own TV show. I want to have my own BBC. I had a podcast. It's not there anymore, but maybe it'll come back in, in future. Um, but with, with television profile, and I almost think, I'm almost like, I think it's a little bit unfair because I find nowadays, if people have a television profile, they're celebrities, they can almost do anything they get given podcasts they get given tv shows they get given the right to write books kids books and in fact you find people that are real craftsmen real kids books writers real people that write fiction books mm -hmm. real people that write present documentaries they're getting crowded out and rightly frustrated by celebrities mm -hmm. that come in and do those things yeah. celebrities that become a kid's author celebrities that present documentaries on the middle east celebrities that produce a podcast and the reason this happens is broadcasters and funders know that there is an audience people but again we, are, we live in an age where we've got I, that's why i love youtubers they're, they're fighting back against the mainstream and in fact uh, long term youtubers <laughs> and stuff will win and bbc will have to like go it, 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 youtube sponsored no bbc youtube as, i don't know how it works so, so sponsored by the bbc yeah, yeah. yeah it's gonna be that <laughs> although bbc i want to be director general one day so i'm not uh, so, oh I'm not so you want to be paxman and also director but yeah i, I want i think like you could do all things in your career you could oh, be yeah, the I person that's that. the face at some stage i want to set my own production company yeah. so right now when i'm young ish and camera worthy mm. i and look young i want to be the person behind the cameras but at some stage i want to own the production company create the the shows that go viral yeah. then become the the the, the director of 
or BBC or a Netflix. Yeah. So that's a longer term when I'm a bit yeah. greyer. And then there's going to be some kind of like salary scandal. Like, why is the director of the BBC being paid so much? Yeah, 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 that's that. Be, you, yeah. That can be you. That can be <laughs> yeah. me, that can be me. That's a dream. <laughs> that's a dream, that's a dream. Bobby Seagull is fine and I'll yeah. to, my, to my villa in the Bahamas somewhere. Yeah, that'll be good. Um, but with, um, we'll come back to about my own experience. Yeah. But I, I genuinely think it is sad that celebrity culture has got to such a stage where I think people that are publishers, broadcasters, um, they feel such a pressure to give instant results, instant success, instant sales, instant viewership that they find it harder to take risks on untested authors, untested broadcasters, untested podcasters. And clearly, if you believe that talent is distributed everywhere, they're clearly brilliant young and not so young podcasters, writers out there that just haven't been discovered. But for some reason, people that are celebrities, whether you've come through a reality show or whether you come from a news show or whatever show you've come through, you've now gained a celebrity. And because that celebrity, you are being offered books, podcasts, television shows. And again, that is the reality for me. Mm. I've had to be honest, I have had to hustle. I work really hard because the reality is normally people that come from television shows that make a TV career come from the more mainstream. They'll come from Love Island produces loads of celebrities. Uh, Bake Off does um, strictly, but they've obviously they've obviously had a platform before. But most reality show people, they have that platform, and then there's like a there's a constant conveyor belt mm. that they produce celebrities. But the reality is, University Challenge doesn't have a conveyor belt. There have been people from University Challenge that have gone on to become famous, but not because of it. But yeah. they've done like Stephen Fry was on University Challenge. Oh yeah, uh, John Simpson, the yeah. the broadcaster, but. University Challenge was incidental. It happened and, oh, you were on University Challenge. Whereas for me, it's a fundamental part of my early story. Mm. But since 1962, no one's managed to use University Challenge and build it to have a media career. So what I'm trying to do is almost unique. No one's unique, I think. But it's almost unique in the sense of I'm trying to build. So it is hard. So many times I'm trying to do things, get onto programs, and then often they're like, oh, we don't really, you're kind of person, you're, you're, you're too smart for a show. And again, it annoys me because I am smart, but I'm trying to bring my, often people forget my mission is trying to bring knowledge in a relatable mm. way. Again, the, part of me could have gone to stay at Cambridge, Oxford, become an academic in maths. Again, if I, if I was an academic, it probably would have been in financial economics, mm. financial maths, because that's my expertise. I could have been like someone that looks at Black Shoals and adapts it to the Black Shoals seagull model, yeah. uh, something that prevents... Financial <laughs> crashes, <laughs> crashes. Uh, but yeah, that would have been my field if I was an academic in okay. in mathematics rather than pure. I'd have been applied maths. But I don't want to necessarily create new material. I want to be the preacher yeah. for preachers of course. because I think it's more fun. You engage more people, and with my books, the same thing. Again, Monkman and Seagull, the BBC approached us saying we'd love you to produce a television. If I was a radio show first, then a book, um, then the television show. But so with the books, we had publishers approach us. So we had. Penguin approach, Monkman and Seagull, we'd want to publish a book with you. We went for a smaller independent publisher that was based in Cambridge. Again, he's like doing things you're comfortable with. At the time, Penguin approaching us, we're like, Penguin, why would they want to approach us? We don't know mm. anything about publishing. So we went for someone that was, that he was an academic in Cambridge that lived there. Yeah. So therefore we felt like, ah, oh, this is a nice gentle step. You know, it's like rejecting celebrity, big brother at the time. Okay, I can go on a BBC panel show, but I'm not going to go on celebrity big brother. Uh, I'm not going to accept Penguin but I will take this small independent indie publisher. Mm. But again, they would not have approached us were it not for us having a television profile. Yeah. And the same thing for my, my second book. Um, I knew that I wanted to write a book about how maths changed my life. So my book is called The Life-Changing Magic of Numbers. To be honest, I wanted to call it The Life-Changing Magic of Maths, but apparently yeah. you can't put maths on the front cover of a book without sales dropping off significantly. So Ooh, it was a subtitle. Yeah. Can you see in the second book? I was like, put it on the, uh, on the second version. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is it there? University Challenge star and BBC Maths Guru yeah. is on there. Yeah. It just says that the life-changing magic of numbers. But in the second book, they, the subtitle says... Oh, how maths shapes everyday they, life. They felt more confident in my brand that they could put the word maths. So it, nice. It look, it's, it's, it's sort of partially autobiographical, looks at my life, tracing it from, from being a child to yeah. being an adult and shows how maths has changed my life in different parts. So how collecting football stickers got me into stats yeah. and got me into maths. How I've applied maths in, in my cooking or my dancing or listening to music or lack of dating. So every part of my life 
or my approach to personal finance, or even approach to like friends, how you can develop friendships in terms of, you know, there's, um, I forget the name of the, 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 the psychologist, but there's a way in terms of, we have five close friends, oh, then you have three yeah. times, you've got 15 friends in a, yeah. in a wider the, region. The Dunbar number? Dunbar yeah. number, yeah. Then about 150. So even like a mathematical approach can be used to take into approaching your friendships. So I talk about how I've applied math throughout my life. So almost like using my engaging life story but the maths underneath that. Okay. So I, I, I did want to publish that. And to be honest, longer term, I want to publish a, a more powerful book on my family and our, our story of how four boys from a council estate in East London all went to Oxbridge, three got Eton scholarships, all conventionally successful. Yeah. And actually, it's not necessarily the talent, but it's the, the hard work the, the, um, over a long period of time, lucky breaks, parents that supported us, a local library, good teachers, all those factors, almost like it's a story of how to succeed in modern Britain. And that's like a book I want to write when I've got a bigger, bigger platform. So I feel like that's my Sunday Times, New York Times, uh, you've heard of it. That's my Sunday Times, New York Times bestseller. How a family in Britain ended up becoming like, my brother's the biggest barrister, one's a world famous artist. Why I'm do you like, care about that? Like Sunday Times, New York Times bestseller type thing? Why do I care? partially ego i like the yeah. idea of having a book that may but also i think the message i genuinely believe the message of success like how's my family successful and i think all of us yeah. are going to be successful and are successful yeah conventionally as it were but that's not because we've got this innate genius gift of sure. course we've got talents but against that concept of like matthew's side of of thousands of hours of yeah. of application again quizzing i'm good at it but i was i haven't got a photographic memory mm. although i've got this weird one little interlude when I was about 12, 13, I had this phase where I would, when I would dream, I would dream of the lessons in school. So I'd genuinely wake up the next morning, I'd revise French vocab. Nice. And, and I had this phase for six, nine months, so I did not need to study. And I don't know how this happened. Was it lucid dreaming? But the books weren't there, but in yeah. my dreams. So it wasn't photographic memory. I had a six month phase, my yeah. six to nine month phase, and I was 12, but I think about adolescence, where my brain was rewiring, yeah. where I genuinely did not need to study. And I, I honestly wish I could have had my brain scanned then because there was something weird. Something weird going on. Going on. Yeah. And I've never had that since. So I've, I'm now like, a, I'm now a normal person. I've got to study. <laughs> I've got the Ebbinghaus curve like anyone else. Okay. Forget from yep. those, yeah. <laughs> so I've got to study um, and do things. But I genuinely think with my family, our story of resilience, working hard, seeking counsel, having family that really loves and supports you, seeking opportunities, exposing yourself to, again, growing up, we played musical instruments, we tried to draw, we, we wrote stories in English, we did lots of clubs, we, we, we almost like polymathic, our dad encouraged trying out, you know, almost like being a generalist in many domains and then finding niches okay. that we become experts. Again, in the media, I'm generally in any field, you can get me talking about personal finance, you can talk, get me talking about politics, business, gossip, reality shows, bake, any, anything you put me in front of, I can very quickly and confidently have a conversation. Okay. And that's partly my upbringing. So I think I almost want to use our family story to show people, yes, there are privileges that exist in my family. We were born to a dad that really wanted to educate his children. We were born in the 21st century. We were born, or oh, 20th actually, <laughs> we were raised in the 21st century. We were born in Britain, so that clearly, but again, there's disadvantages. Yeah. Maybe some people would say growing up in a, immigrant ethnic minority communities at advantage, some people say it's advantage, uh, growing up on a council estate, growing up in the east end of London, so growing up with being short, short, being tall as a privilege, uh, being a five foot five guy, if I was six foot, there'd be other, you know, my dating app, I'd probably, be, I'd probably meet <laughs> more popping, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, again, I, I, I want to acknowledge that, that even though people have disadvantages, like as a family, we have disadvantages, you can still find advantages and make that into a privilege that helps you succeed. So I genuinely think because our family is successful, but there's nothing like magical about yeah. that. So what, what is magical is like finding opportunity and taking advantage of any little like, oh, something there. Yeah. So we talked about kind of the, the, the economics of this business model and it's kind of this, um, this thing of the rich get richer, i.e. The, the more famous just get more famous because yeah. they are the ones afforded the publishing deals and mm -hmm. the TV contracts and, and stuff. From my perspective, or okay, so if we, if we use YouTube as an example, there are people out there who, will, who would have the view that let's say well, once you hit a million subscribers, you've just made it like by default, you're absolutely complete baller, like mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about money ever again, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, and then you would see YouTubers at a million subscribers very concerned, like, oh crap, what if my profile goes mm -hmm. down? What if this, what if, what if that? 
Uh, people would, you know, I'm very transparent about how much money the YouTube channel makes. People would look at that and be like, oh my God, you've made it. You never have to work a day in your life, all that kind of stuff. Mm. But at the same time, I'm still like, oh crap, like, you know, it. this feels like a house of cards. Mm. Like it just takes, I don't know, one instance of getting canceled or or even just over time, people stop caring about What's my stuff. Idea? What's going to happen? Like, am I going to end up broken homeless? And, you know, all of those oh, yeah. kind of anxieties come into it. Um so what's that, what, what is that feeling like for you being a fairly like mainstream celebrity mm. in the UK for this math stuff and having written two, three books mm -hmm. about this? What are the, what are the kind of the pros, the cons, the struggles of the, the economic side? Economics, okay, so firstly what I'll say is economics wise, I would earn a lot more had I stayed in banking. Because really? in terms of guaranteed, oh, guaranteed minimum level. So yeah. the reality is celebrities probably like, uh, most middle-level celebrities, maybe like a hundred, couple of hundred grand, three hundred grand. They're not earning like they're not earning millions because yeah. they get paid per TV appearance. Maybe they'll do like some public talks. Yeah, publish a book, twenty, thirty grand advance plus some more like ten, okay. twenty, thirty yeah. grand. So you know, you know, you're not you're you're comfortable. Yeah, you can earn a few hundred grand. But it's not like Goldman Sachs bank. No. Or so if I wanted to earn like a guaranteed million, two million, three million a year, yeah. I would stay in banking. Yeah. So like I've got siblings in banking that yeah. will earn more than I ever do. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's like trying to find the the balance, the, the 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 pinch point between I do something that's really I find really fulfilling. Yeah. Um. But I will be comfortable, and I do want. Again, there's nothing wrong in saying I want to be wealthy. I want to be wealthy. So so that why why do I want to be wealthy? Mm. Like you can enjoy holidays. To be honest, it's so I can the holidays. I don't take enough holidays. I took my this year. I had like a holiday on a on a friend's. Narrow boat barge. It was my first holiday for like three years. Oh, nice. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a workaholic. Maybe when I'm single as well. I mean, as long as you're having fun. Yeah, I'm having okay. fun. I'm having lots of fun. Maybe with someone else, it could be like even more fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the media world. So if you're the front of face camera, yeah. you can earn a good living. Okay. And you can even you can even earn like a million if you're doing like you're presenting the mainstream. Like Andy yeah. Deck will earn oh. five million a year. Yeah. So you can earn, and then sponsorships will get them more. So you can still earn. Okay. Yeah. A good whack. But to be like to earn the big money, and this is why I talk about my longer ambitions, you need to be the the not just the talent. I hate that yeah. word again. So many words I hate. I heard talent, uh, but I keep using it. I hate celebrity. Um, but the talent and screen, you are still an employee. Yeah. Someone is paying you yes. to bring in the Can't audience. Get rich as an employee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if you are the person creating the formats, yeah, creating the who wants to be a millionaire, yep. the chase, creating this podcast format that gets license and commission around yep. the world that is where the real money is okay. that's where you can make the tens of millions yeah if you want that and again i do want to do that do i want, do I want to do it for the, do i want to do it for the tens of millions not necessarily i want to do it because i think it's a cool thing to do yeah and then obviously with the money you can do you've got more privilege to other things yeah. i like the idea now when i'm young and again with television it's quite a brutal industry you've mm. got there's like element of if you've got a certain element of being telegenic, whether it's being quirky or something about you, yeah. or whatever it is, I've got that some quirky quirkiness about me that people like on camera, my personality, my energy, but it won't always be there. Yeah, you're kind of like an, an it's, it's, it's similar to being a YouTuber where it's, it's sort of like the business model of being an athlete where you've got a few years in the limelight to really make hay while the sun is shining yes. and try and set yourself up for the longevity of a future career. Whereas it's, at least in YouTube, it's very easy to be big and then have your 15 minutes of fame and then, it dies. Yeah. And it's like, this is the thing that keeps me up at night. Is that, is that scary for you? Yeah. Hell yeah. Do you, do you have, do you have anxieties? Like okay, you're a big YouTuber now, yep. but in five years, Oh God, in your, yeah. in your Odyssey plan, is it, is it one of the, is it one of the, like the, uh, I haven't, I haven't explored the, um, the, uh, simulation to that degree, but it's, it's more of a sense of, uh, it's, it's always a fear of like, what if I, what if five years from now I'm just irrelevant because what, what of, would you, what would you, I think I've, I've heard people ask yeah. before. So, okay. So imagine in five years, YouTube gets there's a new government force that says sure. no more YouTube no more allowed YouTube, yeah. and you can't even set up because I know what you might say is mm. I'm preempting you might say I'll start again from scratch yeah. but imagine you're not allowed to sure. what would what would you do oh I'd be a writer writer oh, okay like my thing I, I, or, or rather a teacher but oh. I think you are an educator that's what I was thinking you yeah, are that's like that's my, you are you're an educator uh, that's my hustle so I think a life where I'm spending my time reading writing and teaching mm -hmm. is great and this is why I'm I'm writing a book because I think being a writer affords you a level level of longevity that being a YouTuber does not. Spot on. That's what the celeb. The, in fact, people that are celebrities that have yeah. a TV career and TV career, you have a limited. Some. I think mine is going to be a bit of a longer life. Yeah, life you're kind of intellectual. Like, intellectuals can not, have. You can yeah. be grey and and not as good looking and yeah. bags <laughs> under your eyes. Whereas if you're just like Love Island personality, yes. yeah, you're you're there because you look beautiful yeah. and beauty fades. Intellect 
does fade, but not <laughs> yeah, but, the diminishing but factor. But not the same, yeah. It doesn't, yeah, 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 yeah. Unless you get early onset dementia, in which case it's going to be difficult. Um, but the celebrities that are smart mm. do exactly what you're doing. They try to get, they, they think, they try to diversify their income, mm. develop a portfolio. You can't just rely on television income, even if it gives you a few hundred grand a year. Yeah. You need to think of what is the best long-term income and people have realized writing is. Mm. And if you look at, like, again, this year's Strictly Come Dancing, there's a guy called Tom Fletcher. So Tom Fletcher Tom was in... the do, McFly do, guy. Do, 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 oh, yeah, he's very good. Yeah, he's great songs. Pop but, star. Then, but then he started writing children's yes, books. Yes, and he's the yeah. best-selling. He makes... I bet you he makes more money from writing his books than yeah. anything else now. Yeah. David Williams, famous, yeah. like, Little Britain... Uh, judge and uh, Britain's Got Talent, but he makes his money from being a best-selling author. Wait, he's, he's written a book? Written loads of kids' books. No way. Oh, he's, kids' books. Okay, kids. Right. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, you know, it's like, that was like Roald Dahl, but for the modern era. Yeah. Some people critique it by saying it's not as funny. Probably not because Roald Dahl was a, a genius. He's doing well. Yeah, yeah. But he's making loads, making millions. Yeah. From So oh, the way to make money yeah. as a celebrity and having longevity of that money yeah. is by going into writing. Yeah. And to be honest, to be cynical, yeah. the best way is either two ways are, one is to either do like a lot of self-help stuff. I've noticed on Instagram, mm. like Stacey Solomon, she talks about like, she, she was from X Factor, right. then on Loose Women. Um, and she writes books on like cleaning your house, tidying yeah. up and clean mindset and stuff like that. Or I think the best way is children's writing. Interesting. Because often reality of, uh, of book writing, so you get the, the, the people that buy books are either people that are trying to better themselves. Mm. So teens, 20s, 40s, mm. people think, oh, I want to learn to be a healthier person. I want to I want to learn to overcome my depression. Yeah. I want to learn to be a happier person. So you buy, there'll be people like self-help. And then you've got the, obviously the fiction market. Yeah. Loads of fiction for adult fiction. Yeah. And in fact, like 80% of fiction, I think 80, 70% of readers are females. So if you're writing books, I'm thinking longer term of adult and children's fiction. Yeah. I'm going to write books for female fiction. Yeah, I'd, I'd really love to do it to write like a romance novel. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that would be interesting. That, that, there's a big market there. That most, yeah. most readers of physical books, podcasts are different, yeah. audio books, but most readers of books are females. So that's the market. But children's market is a great way because if you think about it, who makes the purchase? It's parents. Yeah. And parents have disposable income. And when we're talking about like parents, they want to pass on their genes. Mm. And for them to survive, they will pass pass away at some stage. Yeah. And their their investment in the world is mm. their children. So so many parents are happy to spend money on children, on their holidays, on their schooling, yeah. and their books. So if you write books if you, Ali, in fact, you should, if you write books for children mm. on your same mindset stuff, on your productivity, but how, like, you know, like Cal Newport, yeah. before he became a writer on like his, again, we haven't come, come across it today, but his concept of deep work, yeah. how to be a, but he, book behind oh, I love that. It's <laughs> yeah. my, my family is our Bible. Nice. If, I, if, I, if, I, if I went on a desert <laughs> island, I'd have to take, what used to it be on a desert island? I'm yeah, sure, but, but my Bible, deep work, there. Deep yeah. work is one of my, um, uh, one of my Bibles. I, yeah. to be honest, I have a constant battle between, I'm, I don't think I have ADHD. Mm. I've not been diagnosed, mm. but I think the reason I'm successful is yeah. I'm able to like do lots of things, yeah. but also it, it means that when you're trying to write books, write essays, yeah. do PhDs, yeah. my self-diagnosed ADHD <laughs> yeah. is probably not, but is, doesn't help. Uh, but writing books for children and writing books like Matthew Syed does it. Yeah. He's got a book called You Are Awesome mm. on mindset for children. So all the things that you write for adults, mm. if you repurposed and repackaged it for children, mm. more friendly in terms of like pictures, yeah. bits they can fill in, I bet you, you oh, would be a... That's what Adam Kay did really well. He got big off of This Is Gonna Hurt and now he's got the... My, the my, yeah. my, my book agent is Adam Kay's book oh, agent. Nice. So they're like trying to get me to think of like, how can you use your background? So like, for yeah. example, I'm into personal finance. Um, I write again for the FT. I do like, I'm like almost like a, I'm literally a pound shop version of Martin Luther. <laughs> We're both ambassadors for national numeracy, but he's like yeah. in the UK, the god of yeah. personal finance. Like everyone knows him in the UK. Exactly. Yeah. And to be honest, one of my, this I'm not sure, one of my possible ambitions is thinking about, can I try and become like the future version? Yeah. Like in t five, 10, 15 years. Like maybe the TikTok, the TikTok version of money saving TikTok, expert yeah. rather than the blog. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think I have the, the, the dedication to create a website, yeah. like he will create the team. I mean, you can hire a. I could, yeah, yeah, I could do <laughs> that. I could do. But I'm sure he doesn't write his. No, uh, not anymore. Uh, not yeah, anymore. yeah. So it's <laughs> so the possibility for another Bobby. Yeah. Um, but my my agent was saying there's a and for two months I went to them with this idea saying I could create a Martin Lewis but for children. Yeah. Because oh, parents yeah. want to educate their kids about the world. And one of the things parents often are worried about, my child will enter the world of work without yeah. understanding money, taxes. What about writing a book? So there, there's a market nice. to be a Martin Luther. That's really children. good. Have you come across M Mark Tilbury? 
No, I haven't. He's this like guy in his fifties or sixties or something. Who's uh, who's, who's huge on TikTok, like million plus followers, million plus on YouTube as well. And he does personal finance and investing advice for kids. Ooh. And he's got a podcast that I'm going to be on in a couple of months. He's coming on this as well. Um, like father, like son, where he do, it's basically a finance podcast where him and his son talk to guests about money and things. That's why I need to get married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do podcasts with your kids. Um, but his stuff is really good on TikTok. It's 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 a bit like his cringe threshold is also, also fairly high. Um, but it's it's perfect for the audience, like young people being like explaining mindset, financial success, financial literacy. It, it's really good. So that's so, so we're talking about. That. So we're yeah. talking about book writing. Mm. There's a big market. Mm. Children's book, and in fact, again, if you the print market. Is, is is struggling a bit yeah. generally because people are now not reading. I think I was listening to a, was it your podcast? I think is I listen to so much of yours. I get confused between <laughs> yours. Or... I don't, I, I, I don't say anything original. So it's always. Okay. So maybe, maybe it was, a, maybe it was a Cal Newport podcast, but he was talking about how he doesn't use social media at mm. all. Oh yeah. That's his thing. Because he's all about deep work. And again, he reads the, the Washington Post in the morning, mm. maybe watches the news in the evening. That's it. But during the day he's focused on his work, yeah. but he's still, he, he's in fact, he probably has a better nuanced understanding of the world mm. than the people that are constantly on their social taking checking Twitter because the reality of things like social media it's it's just trying to grab your attention it's very um it's news with a short shelf life things within a couple of days that are irrelevant whereas reading long form pieces mm. they take time they take investment reading books but they're the things that help develop us like again if we talk about like our zone of proximal development mm. almost like the the twitter and stuff are almost like little like little splashes of water if you imagine yeah. like zone of proximal development is a living breathing thing Twitter, Instagram, little hits are like throwing splashes of water. Of course, it's good. But, and you're, you're, you're constantly getting that source. But reading a book is almost like going elsewhere, finding a well. Mm. So you're not getting any water for a bit. But once you, once you pipe it up, connect it to your, your 3D sphere of zone of proximal development, you're feeding it water. So it takes effort to find it, it takes effort to make the right connection and stuff. But I think so books, so I think over time, society, there'll be a backlash against this consumer's short term, mm. wanting to know everything at every single moment. Yep. And parents in particular, ones that are not enlightened, but ones that help their kids, they will almost tell their kids, you can't use TikTok constantly, yeah. get a book, read. Yeah. So I think over the next five, 10 years, we're going to see the market for books for children, yep. especially books that help children mm. find their place in the world will succeed. So we have some quick fire questions. Uh, number one, what advice would you give to your younger self? Ooh, younger self. Keep trying out lots of things. Nice. Who's had the biggest influence on your career? My father. Hmm. My father's had the biggest influence because he's the one that's helped me transition between all the different and I think whenever I've fallen down he's been there to support me also my mother as well she brings she does the same but my father yeah. in a different way in right. case you're listening I love you too mom <laughs> what's what's one tip for someone looking for success um the phrase progress not perfection I first heard it in Denzel Washington's um uh, the equalizer oh okay but there's a version by Voltaire yeah. and Confucius mm -hmm. Confucius talks about a diamond with flaws is better than a pebble with none um, but essentially, just try and do something. Like, for example, if you're trying to write a book, yeah. don't just, just start. Just write the yeah. write bloody write page. Write, 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 write a paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, maybe I'm committing today, this weekend. If my agents listen to they're going to be so annoyed. Yeah. I haven't sent them through. <laughs> they're like, send through the first chapter, three chapters. Maybe the first chapter. Maybe maybe a plot synopsis. I will write the first page this weekend. First page. This page. Weekend. Just, 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 it just needs to be a crappy first draft. First page. Okay, I'll I'll WhatsApp what you on the weekend. Please do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what does the first and last hour of your day look like? First hour, first thing I do is I go and get hot, uh, a pint of hot water. Oh, nice. Always. Okay. Um, I'll put the radio on, listen to the news, Radio 4 usually. Or Although nowadays, because of you, I'm trying to listen to more podcasts. Oh. Because of you, BBC has lost a subscriber. Oh. I, I used to always be Today Programme, but now <laughs> I'm like, that's ephemeral news. Yeah. That's, just, that's just the noise, the little bits of drips. Whereas listening to content like yours, mm. and I'm genuinely not trying to flatter you, is stuff that enriches, it's like the piping the well oh. to you. So in the okay. morning that, and I'm normally getting ready to go and do a workout. Mm. So the night before, uh, uh, so this relates to the night before. So the night in the evening, it'll be related to our plan the next day. Mm. Like what my objects, a little whiteboard, um, what the next things I want to do. Mm. I'll verbally or mentally think about things I'm grateful for. I used to have, in fact, my family, this shows you how ahead of our time. We used to, I used to have a gratitude journal when I was like 12, 13. No yeah. Oh. 
That's way before it was cool. Yeah, 12, 13, yeah. every day, write down things I was happy about, yeah. things that it wasn't. So we used to have a gratitude journal, but once I had an argument with myself and it stopped. Yeah. Weird. I, I, weird. I have a weird argument, a monologue about the gratitude journal. I think I've, I feel as if the gratitude journal, there, there were a few things that weren't being progressed mm. in terms of my objectives. I was like, what's the point of you? Gratitude journal. I was writing to say, if I'm not making progress, see you later. Bye. Ooh, I've done that a couple of times. Like, I had stroppiness like myself. A, a toxic productivity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's another what, thing. What's toxic. the point of gratitude if it's not to advance my goals? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the and, and the last hour? You said you. Yeah, it's like so. winding down, listening to some music, having a nice cup of chamomile tea, speaking to my parents. One day it might be my partner, but yeah. What material item under a hundred pounds or so uh, would has had it has has added large amounts of value to your life? Oh, that's a good question. What material item? I would say my trainers. Oh, like shoes? Yeah, I'll tell you oh, why. Okay. Because for me, I have lots of energy. Mm. And some of it gets dissipated, mm. the kinetic energy of my voice, through communication, talking, my subject, maths, yep. my love for education. But the other part is doing exercise and sport. Mm. Without my tra Anywhere I go, if I even go for an overnight stay, I'll take my trainers with me. Nice. So I'll go to the gym, go for a run, yeah. find someone to play tennis with. So if, one of the things is, so obviously long term I want to find a partner, mm. but if I ever lost my ability to do sports, mm. I genuinely think I'd be depressed, like properly oh. depressed. Which trainers do you use? Um, I like these, I've got these Nike black discreet. I always like discreet stuff. Oh. But I also got these funky um, red, looks like Air Jordans, but they're fake Air Jordans. Oh, nice one. But they remind me of the time when I, not that I could, when I couldn't afford fancy shoes, yeah. but I would always <laughs> keep them. They're like, oh, when I couldn't Excellent. afford it. Um, apart from yours, uh, what books, or what book would you recommend to anyone? Ooh. So I would say, do you want probably one of the authors I mentioned today? I, I think I'm going to mention the Matthew Syed one. Mm. I think it's Bounce, the Talent of Myth. Okay. Um, and it's, so Matthew Syed was a um, Commonwealth table tennis player, won, it, mm. won the World the Commonwealth Championship three times. And he's all about dispelling the myth of talent. In fact, I think my whole mission mm. in life is sort of that book because People talk about the maths brain. I've got, I can dance and or I can sing. I'm not meant to be a dancer. I'm meant to, not to be a singer. I think all of us can develop our skills in anything we want. We might not become a gold medalist, world champion. We can become a lot better uh, than we are capable of, of, of that we think we're capable of. We yeah. And that is, that is that. There's no such thing as talent. In that he, I think that book helps to dispel a lot of the myths. Nice. Um, if you lost everything, so fame, accolades, book deals, all that kind of stuff, how would you start again? I would, let's have a look. I'd probably just go back to being a teacher for now. For now, for now. Yeah. I would be go back to being a full-time classroom teacher five days a week, mm. which I'm not anymore. I'm part-time now. Uh, but then I'd be plotting again. Nice. I'd be thinking, how can I... The uh, thing is, I'd, I'd end up veering back towards this career of entertainment yeah. because I I think my... In this Bobby Seagull... Mm. Again, I, I, I genuinely sometimes believe in the multiverse. There are yeah. other Bobby Seagulls. I'm, I'm a big fan. You know, I've studied quantum mechanics and physics. Mm. So I'm a big fan of all that sort of stuff. But I genuinely think in most of these quantum universes, Bobby is drawn towards edutainment because mm. I love learning. Learning is something that's part of my core being. And I love the idea of spreading that knowledge of yeah. learning is cool. Nice. What quote or mantra do you live by? Be the best version of yourself. Love it. And finally, journey or destination? Oh, it's got to be. I think it's, it's one of the things that I could say the wrong thing. It has to be the journey. It's got to be the journey. Got to be journey. Although in in the climb, like Miley Cyrus, yeah, you get. To, I think you'll get to intermediate destinations that you yeah. can sit and enjoy and go. Oh my God, this is cool. Yeah, this is cool. I'm doing this. I've got a book. I've got a podcast. I've yeah. got a multi-million YouTube channel. Yeah. So there, there are intermediate. Yeah, you got to be grateful for the intermediate destination. But it's all about the journey. Like, like it's all about the journey. Nice. Um, Bobby, thank you so much. This has been great. I wish we could c continue chatting for longer, <laughs> but we have a hard stop in about f six minutes time. Uh, if anyone is listening to this and they want to be your assistant or your intern or to help you with, to, to, to join this team that yeah. you will assemble <laughs> because yes, it, it's a no-brainer, uh, wh where can they contact so you? So I think generally social media is the best place. So okay. at Bobby underscore Seagull on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Yep. Um, chat with me there. YouTube is Bobby Seagull TV. Mm. Um, funnily enough, just a quick thing is, People say, why is it not at Bobby Seagull? So at Bobby Seagull on YouTube and Twitter, some annoying people who put no content, like one person on Twitter has done like 20 tweets oh, no. and one person on Instagram or YouTube has done like one video like Minecraft. Yeah. So maybe when I get like really rich and get lawyers to get them to take it. You don't out. even need to. Like if you just email Twitter customer support, they'll probably Bobby give Seagull, it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Because oh, it's annoying <laughs> to have the, the bloody Yeah, underscore. the underscore is a bit annoying. Maybe my, <laughs> book, my autobiography title is going to be the bloody underscore. Oh, hello. The bloody underscore. Because I hate Bobby. I'm Bobby underscore Seagull. Oh no, that's really sad. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, any final message you'd like to impart? Anything you'd like to plug? Um, or, or of course, put links to your books and stuff. Yeah, in the show so, notes yeah. In the so I know if people want to find out my books, The Life Changing Magic of Numbers, the quiz book. Um, people can always reach out to me on social media if they want to chat. But I think my biggest message from today is don't set limits on yourself because society, people, friends, family, parents, who knows, they, even yourself sometimes can do that. But set yourself the maximum possible goals and see what life, take, life takes you. If you can't, you know, you're not going to become an Olympic champion, a gold medalist, a mm. TV presenter, fine. But don't limit yourself. Nice. Love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's Everyone, a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on the iTunes store or something like that and, and we'll catch you later. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.